some may find the following disturbing. Discretion is advised. Put the children to bed. It's time for Dan and Aldo to bear their souls. I love the Chicago Bears more than I do masturbating, and that is a lot. Then, with three seconds left, Bob Avellini throws a 30-something yard touchdown pass to Greg Latta, and the Bears win, and I literally shit my pants. I swear to God, I literally did. <laughs> Eric Kramer, for me, I love the guy. He's a tragic figure. I mean, he embodies all that is... If they don't run the ball here, I'm going to vomit. I swear to God. Look, I don't mean any disrespect. He just didn't play that well. Not for a guy of his caliber. You know, they won, but I'm, I'm going to be miserable all week because they stunk. I don't, I don't really have any recollection of that at all, but I guess perhaps I blacked it all out. So, Dan, tape is the ultimate tool for scouts and for coaches to evaluate players, to detect plays and so forth. And they spend hours looking at tape, right? Why do they so often get shit wrong? Ladies and gentlemen, Dan and Aldo. Listen to that applause, Dan. That is all for you. None of that no, is for me. Come on now. No, no all <laughs> of that is for you. I, I've been getting hate mail. What happened to 100 Proof? You you ruined my life. 100 Proof is no longer my room network. This applause has to be for you, my friend. <laughs> I will just tell you this because uh, I don't want to bullshit anybody. Uh, I hope that I'm not too much of a niche guy that where people are like, I don't know if he deserves his own show. So let's hope that <laughs> this succeeds. Uh, that's my goal is I can to do what you want me to do. Well, I, and I'm not quite sure what it is I want you to do. I do know that you and I agreed on a show title named Bear Your Soul or, or excuse me, Dan and Aldo Bear Their Souls. And so I think we're supposed to bear our souls on this show. And so I'm going to ask you first, how often do you, it is that you masturbate? <laughs> <laughs> At this point in my life? Uh, uh, at least three times. A, no, I'm kidding. I, I don't know. A couple times a week, I guess. You know, if I were 18, I would say five, six times a day. Oh, so. that, yeah. That, I, when I was 18, it was easily four or five times a day. Absolutely. But, I was beating off and getting laid that, at 18. Oh, That's the, <laughs> that is impressive. Yeah, I wish that you could bottle that libido. <laughs> you know, if, you're, if your dick breaks, you can always buy, you know, some kind of of supplement uh, we need to get a sponsor here for blue chew <laughs> yeah, just as yes, an example exactly. you can chew it up and get hard i guess not that i've had to do that yet uh but i'm just saying you can get those things but can you buy the libido that you had at 18 though yeah. like you can be hard but are you necessarily wanting it like you did yeah well, in high school that's what i wish you could buy well I, at my age i just turned 62 this past weekend i can tell you absolutely yes <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, and, and uh, as part of the open, I mentioned that I uh, I shit on my pants when Bob Avellini threw a thirty, I think it was a thirty-two yard touchdown pass to Greg Lotta. This was against the Kansas City Chiefs, and you probably remember the date better than me because you're so much better at that stuff than Is I. Is that am. the seventy-seven game? Yes, nineteen seventy-seven. That's the one with Walter's fantastic highlights. Yes. you know where he's running over the whole team. Yes, I'm telling you that game um was one of those special games you know I, that i put down in my top 10 list of games that i watched and experienced now i wasn't at the game um i, I saw it on television but it was just th thrilling and walter was walter and that dramatic 
touchdown pass. Bob Avellini, one of the uh, most mediocre quarterbacks, and I'm being kind. And he was around forever. Yeah, he was around for a good long time. And Greg Latta makes this stupendous catch. And it just was something that, you know, we were going through an era here in Chicago where you just didn't expect stuff like that to happen, you know, dramatic comebacks and stuff. But that was... That was quite the thrill. Now, you, uh, one of the things that I admire about you so much is that you've got great recall of everything Chicago Bears that you've witnessed, read, what what have you. One game off the top of your head that just gives you thrills at the memory of it. Well, real quick, let me respond to what you said about Bo- our Greg Latta there mm-hmm. and, and Avellini. I wasn't even alive yet, and I knew the game you were talking about. Uh, just uh, as a reference, Bob Avellini's last start was actually in 84. The Bears went to the Kingdom, and uh, McMahon hadn't gotten hurt against the Raiders yet, but he missed a start. And the, I, I'm so glad I have this game because it was one of uh, Franco Harris's only games of Seattle. Uh, he played like four or five games of Seattle, and they cut him because Kurt Warner, who was from West Virginia, uh, was hurt. Uh, and Greg Latta, unfortunately, passed away really young. He died in like 94 yeah. off the top of my head. Yeah. But to answer your question, uh, the, the question was one of the games that, uh, that I cherish, I guess, is what, the way you, yeah. what you were asking? Yeah. Hmm. Let me think. I don't want to hold us up. Uh, as a kid, one of my favorite wins as a kid. You know, I, I, off the top of my head, the first thing that popped in my head was seeing Tom Waddle on opening day against the Vikings in 91 stretch out and catch that touchdown, yeah. which would be the first of seemingly like what, five or six in 91. Mm-hmm. But I was like, who is this guy? Yes. Yeah, Cause I, I, you know, I didn't know, I didn't follow the team until the season started when I, cause I was 10 years old mm-hmm. and I didn't get every game. For example, the next week they go to Tampa Bay. I, I never even seen that game. Mm-hmm. So I did see the Giants game week three, Jets week four, et cetera. But yeah, so Tom Waddle is catch as a, as a kid. Uh, and I was like, wow, this guy might be good. Yeah. You know, like, so I remember that for sure. Yeah, I'll tell you one thing. There have been a lot of good wide receivers in Chicago Bears history who probably would have been much better on other teams given the plight, uh, the, the, given the the voodoo, given the, the this hex that the Bears are under that they just can't land a good quarterback for any long period of time. And uh, Waddle was one of those guys who, you know, you would put him in a system like with the Patriots and he would have had 100 uh uh, receptions for multiple years, and uh, but he gave us some thrills as a Chicago Bear. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, that Monday night game against the Jets was kind of like his coming out party for the whole nation. Mm-hmm. Uh, that incredible game where the the Bears were down like 13 to six, and I don't know if you remember the game I'm talking about. They're down 13 to six, like yeah. uh, less than a minute to go, and McMichael strips Blair Thomas, which was a miracle. Yes. The Jets should have been kneeling down. It's kind of like another miracle to Meadowlands, but this one was a Soldier Field. Yeah. And then Neil Anderson caught a pass with no time left, and then they go into overtime, and it's almost a tie. Bozo gets in. He doesn't. They bring him back out, and Harbaugh dives in on a quarterback sneak with, like, fucking four seconds to go. And, and Incredible and, incredible and, night. That game was on at, like, 1.30 p.m. Eastern – or 1.30 a.m. Eastern time for Monday Night Football. And and one of the memories of that game, correct me if I'm wrong, is Bozo getting up uh, off the – With the grass, yeah. <laughs> yes, lodged in his helmet. It's like a yeah. huge clunk of it. <laughs> and the Bears, that's what I've uh, my first ever call to Waddle and Sylvie. Mm-hmm. I was telling Greg Braggs this. My first ever call was in like 2011. And I understand now uh, I should have known better, but I was trying to get Tom to play, to give him the truth serum mm-hmm. and to get him to like elaborate on the old games for just a minute, which I know it's not necessarily the best radio because we're in the today business, mm-hmm. uh, at least on FM or AM radio anyway. But I, the Bears, when they beat the Jets there, they were 4-0. and And the 91 Bears, the thing that they had, like if statistically Harbaugh was passing that year, unlike any other team under Ditka's, you know, tutelage. Hmm. So you just thought, man, maybe this team, maybe they, I mean, they're not the 85 Bears, but they could be good, you know? And then like they they go from 4-0 and to 4-2 and because they played Buffalo and Washington the next two weeks, which both teams would go to the Super Bowl that year. So, but my question was, uh, they lose 
you know, a game to the Dolphins because of Kevin Butler missing a short field goal, which he did frequently. I'm sorry. I, uh, he did. And uh, he had a great 1985, and he had a lot of, ugh, after that. He, he did. did. He was there forever, but he did. He missed a lot of significant kicks. That's but true. point is, if the, he makes that kick, the Bears have a bye, and they don't play Dallas in the first round. But they almost came back and beat Dallas anyway. Harbaugh gets picked off. But I was going to ask Waddle, said, what if you guys had gone to Detroit, if you get by Dallas? Mm. Eric, Eric Kramer has that big game against Dallas. But what? I mean, the Bears, would that would have been their third game with Detroit. And they were 1-1 one one earlier. I think that they could have beaten the Lions there. And then you're in the NFC Championship game, and you're playing Washington, a team you've already played. The first game they get, they lose twenty to seven. They're kind of it's they're blown up because they can't stop Charles Mann. Mm -hmm. He had like five sacks that day. So my point is, the significance of having that earlier game, maybe you know how to block him better. And if you can beat, why you're in another Super Bowl? I mean, so basically, am I? Just, I basically asked Waddle. I said, am I just a fanboy here? Is this irrational? To, to think that you were that close, and he was just like, oh, Dan, you know, we don't play the what-if game. It's uh, We lost to Dallas. <laughs> you know, but still, it just they were so close. You, you submitted a question to um, Jim McMahon, a what-if question, and uh, what was it that Mike North said when he heard the question? <laughs> uh, yeah, Mike North told me to go home and, and light a candle. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I just need to let all these uh, games go out. I was telling my, my girlfriend now uh, the other day, I said, the thing is, because, uh, you know, she's not a huge sports fan. You know, she she attended West Virginia University. So she went to like the, the Mountaineer games just when she was there, you know. Uh -huh. uh, but I told her the thing is, at least as a Bears fan, for me, when they lose, it feels like every game is like a cancer diagnosis, which I'm not belittling anyone who actually goes through that, so maybe I shouldn't have worded it that way. <laughs> but every game just feels like, oh, my God, just the ultimate <laughs> failure where you, like, 30 years later, I'm still worrying, you know, thinking about certain games. But when you win, it's not like euphoria. It's just like, it's like your car was broken down at a railroad crossing, you and you barely made it before the train hit you. You're just like, oh, thank God we pulled it out. You know, when you win, you're not even really that happy. It's just like, oh, you yeah. know, thank God. Yes. Versus when you lose, it feels like the world is ending. Every, I mean, it is incredible. Anyone that's listening to the show probably is, is very similar to you and me. You know, our our entire week is affected by how the Bears play. And in, in the open, I mentioned, you know, I, I'm going to feel miserable all week, even though we won because we, we played and, and stunk. And I remember, do you remember the, 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 the game um, where Waddle made all those tremendous catches and John Madden? Uh, uh, that was the playoff game, right? Yeah, against Dallas, right, right yeah. Uh, and I was, you know, so miserable because of how poorly we played in that game. And whether we would have won or lost that game, it didn't matter. The The only thing that was good was Waddle's performance. Everything else on offense was just putrid. And how many times has that happened to this team that I've just I'm, – I'm looking for an offense for the Chicago Bears that every week is putting up – 28 plus points is getting three to four 500 yards of offense has a quarterback who is meticulously accurate has a running game and an offensive line second to none i'm just hoping and praying that for one magical season i can see that before i am buried i i mean i'm burying my soul right now i well, really really want to see you, that at least you had 85, yes. like in the sense that, you know, I've got every game and, you know, I can recall every game, but, but I watched them later because mm -hmm. my first earliest memories of the Bears were just pop culture related, which I told you Jim McMahon was my childhood hero. Right. So I knew McMahon from Taco Bell and things like that, the scooter. <laughs> so I started like, okay, well, he's a Bears guy, so I'm going to like the Bears. But my earliest memories of the Bears are of in the 87 season. Uh, so the Super Bowl, which I have in its entirety, along with every game that season, I didn't experience it the way I would have now, or the way I could have in 2006, hmm. had they won a, a, through the eyes of an adult. Right. So I, I envy that 
Because you would have been, what, in your early 20s when yeah. they won the Super Bowl? Ah, uh, let's see. I was uh, in my mid-20s, yeah. Yeah, so you leave, I, I envy that, but I get – I feel the same way as you. Like, just please, man, I'm going to be 40 this year. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I don't want to jump ahead, but I was I was watching uh, – or reading, rather, CBS and ES, ESPN had this prognostication – where they simulated every game of the 2020 season in some fucking computer. I don't know what it is. Oh, cool. Yeah, and uh, they have the Cowboys and the Chiefs in the Super Bowl. Of course. Why is it? Why did this love with Dallas? <laughs> and then CBS just had a guy, their guy, do the predictions. Mm-hmm. It might as well have been Jason Lock and Flora because CBS <laughs> has predicted that Dak Prescott will be the league MVP this year. And oh, to finish it out, ESPN predicted the Chiefs to beat the Cowboys in the Super Bowl. CBS predicts Dallas to beat the Chiefs in the Super Bowl. Uh, yeah. So please explain that to me. I mean, was there any, did you see any. Uh, uh, believable, plausible rationale for that prediction? No, I I don't. Well, I told a guy I work with before we went on air. I said I feel pretty confident in this. I don't, God, watch me end up eating my words now. <laughs> I said I would be willing to say go on air and say if we could. Of course, the FM would preclude me from saying this. But I was like I'd go on there and say I would suck a listener off <laughs> if Dak Prescott would win the league MVP and I'm so confident that is not going to happen I don't want to shit on Dak Prescott but I don't think I'm going to have to suck a guy's dick because he's not going to be the league MVP and I, maybe Dallas wins that division I don't know but I, they've not won a Super Bowl since 1995 but every year they're considered a perennial favorite when I don't think they've won but like two playoff games since Barry Switzer was coach Speaking of about shitting on Dak Prescott, you sent oh. me something today about Odell Beckham and and shitting, and I, I I apologize, I didn't get a chance to open it up and read it. What was that all about? Apparently, Odell Beckham. I don't know how this leaked out. Uh, <laughs> leaked out. <laughs> yeah, no pun intended. Uh, apparently, he has a, a fetish for women, and I assume it's women. I mean, it could, <laughs> could be, you know, cross dressers for all I know, but I think it's women. He has a thing to. Uh, allegedly, that he likes to have women uh, take shits on him. Jesus. He likes to be defecated on. I, I can't believe that's true. What, what? That, allegedly, that is true. You know, I thought it was shocking when they said Rex Ryan well, liked yeah. to have a foot fetish or whatever. Could you imagine? Actual Rex, video of that. <laughs> could you imagine anybody getting <laughs> shit on and enjoying it? I just I, I don't, don't get it. I remember watching a Howard Stern episode where he brought in some guy who liked to have women vomit on him, and so they hired Ugh. some prostitute or somebody to come into the studio and do that same thing. And uh, I, I don't think I've watched the Stern show since. <laughs> uh, but it, where, where was it? What was the source? The source of that Beckham story? I don't know. I can go back and read it now if yeah, you want me to. I, Again, I read that as soon as I'd been. My friend sent it to me. And so when I wake up, as you know, I'm nocturnal because of my jobs. Right. Uh, he uh, sent this to me while I was asleep. Oh, it's and from, it's from Barstool. Barstool Sports. Okay. And uh, I, I, I saw like 50 things all at the same. Oh, Von Miller's out for the season. Oh, Odell Beckham likes to have women shit on him. <laughs> you know, it was kind of all at the same time. So I just more or less read the, the headlines such as yourself. I didn't go into the story, but. I do have. A, I'll bear my soul with a a, a a a vulgar, inappropriate sex story. If you want to hear it, sure, let's go. <laughs> uh, the the most, I guess you could say, filthy thing I've done in terms of like I've never had anybody shit on me. So I'll just go ahead and say that. <laughs> if you thought I was going to confess that or bear my soul to that, you're you're mistaken. <laughs> but I did have. Uh, I won't get into the full story, but I could. But her her name, I'll just say Amanda, because okay. that's it. Could be anybody. All right. Uh, I'll say she's the only Native American lady that I ever slept with, and she t- she says, "Well, I'm drunk, I, and uh, I talk more when I'm drunk than I am when I'm even sober." So I'm on the phone with her, and she's like, "Yeah, you know, uh, you know, I really likes water sports." And I was sitting there thinking, like, again, I'm drunk, but I was like, she doesn't mean like some fucking going on the lake shit here. I mean, she means something like pissing i think so she keeps talking and i interrupt i was like listen i haven't heard anything you've said the last two minutes what do you mean by water sports <laughs> and again i'd already slept with her a few times you know so anyway she was really close by so i go make a long story short i go for my apartment which i'm not advocating 
I'm like one mile away, which still you could get into an accident, could get a DUI. Mm-hmm. I do not recommend or advocate driving drunk. I was uh, 28 or whatever. So it's not that that excuses it, but I was a fool for doing it. But I go anyway and I'm hammered and I go over there and um, it's not as easy as you might think. So she wants me to urinate inside her vagina. <laughs> Jesus. And so I'm trying to do it, and I'd been drinking beer all day. I remember the, the NBA playoffs had just started. It was in like May of 09. So it was one of those days where you watch like three or four playoff games back to back to back to back. So I'd been watching the NBA all day, been drinking all day, and I, I, I was like, I know I have to piss. I can feel it. But I guess when you're erect and you're in there, there's something anatomically shuts off. Yeah. So <laughs> yes, I had to pull it out. And put it on her bare midriff and kind of just, you know, let it start going. And then I stick it in. And it was like a hose going in, like when you're filling up your gas. <laughs> and then it just went. And I swear, I was telling Brock this earlier. She let out a roar of pleasure that I could never induce with my mouth or my penis in any other scenario. I'm not trying to imply that she came because, again, I was drunk. I, I don't know. It was a long time ago. But I know she went over the top with her appreciation of it. Oh, gosh. And to conclude the story, so I Please. finished my, my long piss inside of her, which is absolutely true. And I'm on her bed. Thank God, not my bed. And she stands up over top of me without saying anything, and she starts pissing on me. (laughs) And all I could think of at that moment in time was, God, that is so much warmer than I ever thought. (laughs) That's my only recollection of it, other than the fact I went and showered as soon as she was done. Oh, wow. Well, uh, it, it, it... Allegedly, there's a president of, a, of some country who is into that kind of thing. So uh, maybe <laughs> a man that should be giving this per- particular person a call. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, Amanda moved to Tennessee. Maybe she's down there with Jay Cutler now. I, I haven't seen her since about 2010, I think. <laughs> so. that, that's an incredibly wild story. Now, I wish it's I had true. a story to top that, but I don't. I I, I have a, a, a relative, I'll, I won't say his name, he's a cousin of mine whose wife told me that a couple of nights ago he asked me to piss in his mouth. And oh. yeah, so I had that over him and I've been waiting for the appropriate time to just spring that on him. So, uh, Victor, if you're listening, this is the time. <laughs> <laughs> how do you, how does one address that? Like, I hear you like ladies to pee in your mouth. <laughs> I don't, I've never, never even heard of that. I mean, it, it probably falls under the general category of water sports, but I, I, you would think there's a, something more specific for a, a more specific name for that activity, but I, I don't know. And right. I, I don't know why anybody would. I've got, I've it. got one more vulgar one <laughs> okay. and, and, uh, I hope this is good radio. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is true. I got I got two two experiences like this, and 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 I'll just come out with it. Have you ever had a lady that? How do I say it without saying it that that squirted when she orgasmed? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. I've only been with two women that that squirted. Mm-hmm. Now the one lady, uh, she was actually the first African American lady that I'd ever slept with. She did it, and it tasted. I don't know, like, like, like vagina. I was excited. I was into it. I was like, wow. You know, internally I was clapping. I was mm-hmm. like, wow, this is, I thought it was like some, some shit they did on porn that wasn't real. It was like a prop, <laughs> you know, like, but here it is like, wow, you know, <laughs> but the second lady I did it, uh, the white lady, mm-hmm. every time she did it, it tasted like piss. It was uh, horrible. And I would never admit that to her because she didn't taste bad when you were doing it. Oh, no. But when she finished it was so awful. Mm. I mean, it was terrible. Uh. So I can say that if urine tastes anything like, <clears throat> I'm just, her name is so unique that like if she would ever listen, she would know I was talking about her. So I won't even say a name. Let's just say Lady X. If anybody's <laughs> vagina or piss tastes like that, <laughs> then I would rather eat my own fucking sperm than taste that. <laughs> Well, apparently my sperm tastes awful because uh, women have been spitting it out for decades. 
<laughs> All right, it is. We're halfway through the show, and so we better talk. Football. Oh, come on! What else we got to do? <laughs> That's right. What else? All right. Uh, so let's let's touch a little bit about uh, the Ryan Pace press conference. Did you hear any of it? Uh? Yeah, I listened to it okay. in clips. Uh, I was listening to it and listening to everybody else react to it. But I've probably heard the same ten minutes or whatever, like fifty times, seemingly. Mm-hmm. And your impression of those ten minutes. <laughs> Well, the most visceral thing that comes to my head was, uh, and again, I don't want to be angry at a man who's who's stricken with cancer right now, but, and I wish him well, Mark Silverman. Mm -hmm. But my God, like I just wish Sylvie would come out and say, like during the whole summer, I I'm a Nick Foles guy, or I don't like Trubisky. I'm done with Trubisky. Mm -hmm. Because he's been dishonest about it. He's made it seem like everybody who would support Mitch has, you know, is not in reality, which has sparked some great phone calls from from Greg Braggs. But the, he played the press conference over and over as a way to say that Ryan Pace was lying, that the whole competition, I don't want to take his words out of context, but he was basically intimating that Pace had 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 his mind made up since December that Trubisky was going to be the starter. And as a result, the bears are going to suck. And then next year we're going to be in quarterback hell again. And I can't say that I necessarily disagree with it, but the fact that he's pretended for it, that he was being so objective is the part that I take opposition to. Uh, but to answer your question, I, I was a little bit for my reaction to uh, Pace's, the thing that annoys me about Pace so much is, and I can't do a Pace impression, but I guess I'll try. Go ahead. When he's like, uh, you know, we're so <laughs> Mitch, Mitch is, uh, I mean, we're so excited. Mitch is, he's showing more <laughs> leadership than he's ever had before. You know, it's just the same shit. He says it every time he speaks. I was closer like to Michael more- McCaskey than Ryan Pace, but please go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's like, you know, Mitch is more confident than he's ever been before. You know, I mean, I know that's a terrible pace. It, it's <laughs> meant to be a caricature, not necessarily an impression. But it's just like, come on, man. And, you know, like, I think the most impressive audio that I heard from anybody about the decision was from Bobby Massey. Mm hmm. Uh, Bobby Massey, if I'm, if I can paraphrase it, cause I don't remember the exact quotes. He was just kind of like, you know, his disposition was like, okay, I don't really want to talk about this shit, but if you really want me to, I'll say, yeah, he's been working on his foot. He's been really, really working on his footwork this entire off season. And mm-hmm. he's, he's like, it's not just been throwing. He's been busy this entire time. And I have, I really respect him. So I mean, again, that's just the gist of what he said. Not a direct quote, right? But to come from your right tackle, I mean, if they were, if that's the most thing that they can think of is to say, because they're trying to give you a compliment. But if it is like he's worked his ass off the whole off season on fundamentals, I mean, that's better than the alternative. Well, to say he's done nothing, you know, I mean, like right. that's that's good, right? He's worked his ass off the whole off season on fundamentals. That's good. That's what we we've been complaining about his feet. Yep. Well, but what's troubling about that is that Matt Nagy is asked about it. He goes, I don't, I don't see he, I don't think he has a problem with his mechanics or his fundamentals. And, and, and he's clearly lying there. He's clearly lying and downplaying that. And that's fine. For if he wants to coddle Mitch Trubisky, then go ahead and coddle him. But don't bullshit us. You know, it is clear that this guy has issues with his mechanics, and it is clear that the Chicago Bears coaching staff has fumbled the ball because they have not addressed this openly with Trubisky. And and it's clear that Dave Ragone is no longer the quarterback coach because they knew that Mitch Trubisky had problems with his footwork, with his processing, and so that's why DeFilippo was brought in. Ragone is still on the team for some reason. They must like him. You know, one of the things that I've learned over the last several years is that the coaching fraternity is really a buddy-buddy situation. There are stories about Lovey Smith and why he failed at his job because he was so loyal to assistant coaches and and would 
uh, side with his buddies over more qualified coaches, Ron Rivera, because they were his friends and he wanted to maintain those friendships. And I've seen it here and talking to Greg Gabriel, who comes here every week to do his Gabriel and Schuster talk bears. He sh shared stories with me about that fraternity. And it just makes me sick that these guys who are professional coaches are so willing to throw away a season, so willing to live with mistakes from their players because they want to maintain their friendships because there's a loyalty to this person. I can't fire him and so forth. Dave Ragone should have been fired when Mitch Trubisky, excuse me, when Matt Nagy got the job. He should have brought in all of his own people. So it, it just irritates the shit out of me. And it is obvious as the nose on my face, my big fat nose, that uh, Trubisky has, has needed all of this coaching in his rookie season. And Dow Loggins was the worst guy to have as his offensive coordinator, quarterback coach, because he did nothing to correct that. And then you bring in the, the, uh, the offensive genius, Matt Nagy, and, and nothing changed. He was still doing the same stuff that I saw in his college tape when I said, Matt, uh, when I said Mitch Trubisky is a second-round draft pick. He has only got one year of college football experience, and he's got terrible mechanics that he was able to get away with uh, in college football. And I'm telling you, it just it, it blows my mind the way they've handled this situation, and it's just so typical of the Bears in that quarterback position. It drives me nuts. And as for Ryan Pace's press conference, I was as annoyed as you were because – this was, again, trying to put a rosy picture on something that doesn't really deserve. His, his optimism is starting to make me sick. It's the same press conference at the start of every year. It's the same press conference every year. And, and perhaps, you know, maybe I'm being too rough on the guy. What, what is he supposed to say? But I, I'm just tired of all the optimism and then being let down at, at the at – the, three games into the season you know it's not the team that we, we've been sold i got like 50 things to say <laughs> so, please go ahead uh, okay first off the the initial thing with nagy i oh my god did you hear when he said that he like misinterpreted his own answer that was a quote that he used i misinterpreted what i meant there yes, yes. <laughs> see that's a lie that's a lie absolutely that, i mean that's i got caught in a lie Mm -hmm. And and Nagy seems like he might be a good guy. I he tries to he's not condescending like John Fox, so I like that. Mm -hmm. But still, he got caught in a lie. Mm -hmm. uh, with regards to like you were talking about assistants, uh, yeah, Ragone's been there since Cutler was there. Cutler loved. He's like rags, rags, and he liked uh, Dow Loggins too. Right. But before I even touch anything else with Ryan Pace, because I have something to say there, you were mentioning Lovey and assistant coaches. Did you see? that Lovey's former assistant coach, um, his fucking son, was arrested mm, yes, I for did being a pimp. Yeah. For fucking pimping women and sex trafficking. Lovey Smith's fucking son. Yes, I, I take no joy in this. It's just oh. crazy. I mean, think about it. In the Super Bowl, we lost to the Colts. Tony Dungy's son killed himself. Yeah. Uh, Lovey Smith's son is allegedly a pimp. <laughs> and and you know how much Nagy loves Andy Reid. Andy Reid's son, if I recall correctly, died of a heroin overdose. That is correct. That is so correct. So it's just like all these coaches, man, have these horrible life stories at the house. Mm -hmm. it, but I was really shocked because Lovey had, had, I had been. I don't know if he worked with his son at the University of Illinois, but you know he carried him to Tampa Bay, and you know obviously the kid grew up wealthy. Yep. I mean, what did it's just shocking because Lovey, I mean, for all of his faults as a coach, seems like a good man, you know? I mean, like, I just, I, I'm shocked that Lovey's son would be in some, I mean, it's not a reflection of Lovey. He can't be his dad forever and, like, be his guardian over his actions, right. but it's still <clears throat> really shocking to me that Lovey Smith's son would allegedly be involved in this kind of shit. But, to uh, go real quick to what you said about Ryan Pace, mm -hmm. and I'm not disagreeing with you because I generally agree, but 
just to defend Pace, which he does not deserve, I think. But to be fair, uh, up until like last season, he kind of always downplayed expectations because I think he knew that there was such a significant rebuild. And whenever he would go on Hogan Johns or even Waddle and Sylvie, they would kind of, where do you think the Bears are this year? He would always kind of downplay it until last season with the 100th season, I think is when he got burnt by that. Yeah. But yeah. this year, he sounded like Phil Emery saying our goal is to win a championship. But again, he never said that before the 2019 season. Mm -hmm. So it's not like he says it every year, but maybe he says it every year now. Mm hmm but like you said, would you want him to say our goal is to win the championship or our goal is to finish second in the North? Yeah. yeah so, I, I, but I think he's close to being fired because if Trubisky falls on his face, you know, real quick, I know you're wanting to talk. And I don't no, 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 to, please, please, go ahead, please. It makes me, it makes me think of 07 in a lot of ways because mm -hmm. we go into the season and we're like, well, if Rex struggles, there's going to be a leash. There's going to be a leash. And we're going to go to this veteran that we know we have and he can play well. And after week three, they benched Rex against the Cowboys. Uh, they, the Romo blew the Bears out on Sunday Night Football. And in week four, they started Brian Greasy. And Greasy, the rest of the way, in his starts, would have these phenomenal wins in Philadelphia, no timeouts, 92 yards a minute, you know. And then they, he had a, a big win at Sunday Night Football in Green Bay. But then he would come home and lose – to the fucking Lions and the Minnesota. And, and back then, it's not like either team was hugely successful. So my point is, they thought Greasy was their ace in the hole. Mm -hmm. And the way we're presenting Nick Foles now is we know he's going to come in and play well. And again, I'm not anti-Nick Foles. The guy deserves all the praise in the world for what he did with the Eagles and winning the Super Bowl and being MVP and beating the Patriots. But we don't know that he's necessarily going to play well. And the fact that the Bears gave up a fourth-round pick for him, if Mitch struggles and they put Foles in and he struggles, ooh, it just seems like Pace has got to go then. I, I don't think Pace is going anywhere. I do believe that the McCaskey family, they love him like a son. I think that they are – proud of the fact that he has transformed Hallis Hall, uh, that he's made uh, decisions that have improved the organization in some ways, that he got them into the playoffs. He, but let's face it, he inherited a terrible, terrible team. And I think that he was, John Fox was forced upon him. And so I think the McCaskies have said, well, we're, we're going to give you some more leniency. We're going to give you a, a bigger rope here, uh, whatever the cliche is, because, you know, some of this stuff you inherited was terrible. And then we kind of forced Fox on you. So you're in control. We're going to stay out of your way. And so I think when he signed that contract, what was the he signed the contract the, in the beginning of last year, was it or, or two years ago? Do you recall? Yeah, I think it was after the 18 season, yeah. if I recall correctly. So I think they're going to keep him, you know, throughout the length of that contract. I think he, it just appears to me that there is this kind of father son relationship between George McCaskey and Ryan Pace. And I think that. They, they've made this commitment to Ryan Pace, and, and they're going to fulfill it. They're going to let him. So bluntly, then, it, let's say everything goes awry the way Silver, Mark Silverman thinks that it's going to now. Mm -hmm. If the season, if they struggle, and, you know, everybody, like, I think it was USA Today at the Bears 3-13. and 13. I was just reading the New York Times uh, about an hour ago before we went on. And they had the Bears 8-8. Eight and eight. So let's assume the Bears, it doesn't matter what the record is. They don't make the playoffs. They're a failure. Mm -hmm. You think, Pace, and I'm not disagreeing with them. I'm just saying you think Pace will get a shot to draft another quarterback next year. Yeah, I do. I mean, it, it depends on what that losing season looks like. It, if it is, you know, if you've got 50 to nothing losses like we had during Trestman's last year. Oh, yeah, the end of Trestman. Yeah, I mean, it, it, a lot depends upon the quality of play. You know, they could lose 10 games, and and the total differential of those losses be, you know, 15 points. And in which case, you say, hey, you know, we, we played well, but it, it just didn't happen this year. I, I just I, I got a feeling that uh, outside of a, a two, three, four win season that he's back, he'll get another chance to draft a quarterback, 
And um, well, let's say they go three and thirteen or four and twelve, the way some people are predicting. Yeah. Uh, let, let's just say, for the sake of the argument, that happens. Okay. Do you think there's a chance that Nagy and Pace both get the fucking boot? Yeah, there's a small chance. I do. I, you know, I, I don't think it's going to happen. Dan and Aldo will be right back. Doug Buffoon. This defense sucks. This is moronic. John Buffoon. If your best run plays are coming off end arounds, there's a problem. Doug was behind the microphone first. He never held back. Very difficult to score when your offense is on the bench. When your defense is out there giving up 70, 80, 70, 64 yard drives. Now, it's his nephew, John, and there's no holding this buffoon back either. An offensive-minded coach that's running an offense that got nine yards and a half. A beaten-up defense that isn't necessarily performing in key situations. And a quarterback that was expected to take a big step forward looks like an unsalvageable wreck. I've had it! I have had it! I want somebody to get kicked in the ass! How many games can you rattle off that involve the team running the ball seven times and they win? I can't think of any. I don't mind you getting beat. I got my ass whipped many times. But I tell you, I took somebody down with me. Because Bears fans wanted to believe in the worst way that Chicago had a stable, competitive franchise. And this is what we got. It's Buffone 55, the John Buffone Show. Every Wednesday, John Buffon and Alyssa Barberi have a special guest, and they will preview the upcoming Bears game with a guest who knows all about the opponent. So check for it on your podcast stream late Wednesday night, early Thursday morning. Buffon 55, here on the Barroom Network. We now return to Dan and Aldo, Bear Their Souls. Quality of play is is so bad. You know, I was going to save this for the end of the show because I was I wanted to do a segment. What what do you fear might happen in week one? Well, <laughs> if they if they go out if they go out in week one, they get bushwhacked by the Lions. I, then you know this this will be the worst thing that has happened this year, even with COVID nineteen. Well, uh, I got to react to that. No, first off, I don't want to uh, to bring this into fruition. I don't want this to happen. I do not want to be right. But my biggest fear Sunday, other than actually losing or somebody getting hurt, you know, mm-hmm. that's irreplaceable. Mm-hmm. The way Vaughn Miller got hurt today for Denver. Right. I uh, you, you don't want that to be Akeem Hicks again. You certainly don't want that to be Khalil Mack. You know, uh, but my biggest fear is Mitch leads the drive down the field and fucking Cairo Santos comes marching on the field (laughs) with nobody in the stands on turf with no weather interference and the kick is up and it hits the fucking upright and we lose. That's I, I may, maybe Eddie Pinheiro <laughs> does the same thing. It's not like I'm, uh, I, I want Eddie to be good. I want him to be our guy. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to be rooting for Santos now, who presumably is going to be kicking on Sunday because they have to activate somebody with, that is correct. with, with uh, Pinheiro going to IR. That's right. But, yeah. you know, let me say this. I, I actually mentioned this to Waddle on uh, Twitter, and he responded to me. Because this whole offseason, you know, Waddle's defense all right off the top is, look, I'm putting my money where my mouth is and making and, and betting, not just in theory, like I'm literally betting money on this. Okay. So he says, I'm confident in what I'm saying. I'm not just blowing, bloviating. But he's been shitting on the Lions a lot. Mm-hmm. And my response to him was, you do recall that the Lions had taken nine of ten from the Bears before Matt Nagy got there. Yeah. And in the, over the last decade, the Lions have made the playoffs more than the Bears. Mm-hmm. So I don't feel confident in just saying, well, you know, it's the Lions. The Lions have been better than us. They truly have been. Not Maybe not in 2018, and, and we swept them last year, and thank God for that. But you remember, they struggled against Detroit with a backup quarterback that no one had ever heard of on Thanksgiving uh, last season. Right. Well, David they, Bland or something? What was that guy's name? Blau, I believe. David Blau, yeah. yeah. Did, didn't there, wasn't there a backup in the one at Soldier Field, too? Yeah, I believe you're right. I, I don't. Uh, think... Dick Trickle or something? <laughs> <laughs> Dick Trickle. 
<laughs> that, yeah, Driscoll, I think the name yeah, yeah, is. <laughs> just saying that Stafford is a good quarterback. <laughs> yes, Stafford is a signed, very good quarterback. There's no they doubt. They signed Jamie Collins from the former Patriot. Mm-hmm. They've already got that. What was What's their big guy that they signed from the Patriots last year? Uh, their big sack guy. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, the point is, they're not, they're not just... I'm not one of these guys that thinks the Lions are going to go 13 and three by each. I don't think that they're the laughing stock that everybody makes them out to be. I think Sunday's wide open. Well, it could go either way. Let's let's listen to uh, Anthony Miller and you. You have great recall. You you recall the uh, game winning drive on Thanksgiving. The Chicago Bears. Anthony Miller made a couple of key catches on that drive. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Well, he, yeah, he was, had a really good game that day overall. He, he did indeed. He was asked about that today, uh, being Wednesday. Uh, no, t- excuse me, Tuesday. He was asked about that at the press conference. This is what he said. Um, just the schemes that they play. You know, I feel like we take full advantage of um, the defenses that they that they come with. So, um, I feel like we'll be prepared this week as well. Um, we don't think they're going to change their defense too much, but. Um, <clears throat> In any situation, I feel like we'll adjust well uh, either way. They play a man-to-man defense. They played more man-to-man defense than any other team in the NFL except the New England Patriots, where Matt Patricia comes from. Sure. And the Bears' wide receivers are well-suited to beat man-to-man. Um, so I, I, my hope here – uh, Sunday is that this offense is going to come out and play the type of football that I hoped they would on Monday night football against the Green Bay Packers. <laughs> but instead they scorch only, what, three points? But I, I, I truly believe that they've got an opportunity here to post uh, some 20-plus points and that, that this defense is going to hold the Lions to a couple of touchdowns. Now, it's probably going to be a lot closer than that. But I start off the season, I'm burying my soul here, Dan. I start off the season always optimistic with, and I suppress the pessimism because deep down in my heart, I know that something terrible is going to happen, but I suppress it and I hope and I pray and I wish and I, and, and, and I, I stay up at night thinking that these Bears are going to be the team that I've always dreamed they could be. And that Mitchell Trubisky, despite the fact that I always thought he was a second-round draft pick, there's somehow some miraculous way things are just going to click for him on Sunday against the Lions, and he's going to lead us to a a great victory, passing over 300 yards, running for 60-plus yards, because that's a big part of his arsenal, you know, and keeping the defenses uh, honest. And that the running game, which we we need to talk about the running game. Yeah, yeah. Let me me respond to the first part of that. (laughs) Sure. uh, I'll give you optimism. And again, we all watched the Jordan last dance, you know, earlier this spring. Mm Mm-hmm. And again, this is probably going to make somebody's eyes roll, but okay, he's never going to be Patrick Mahomes, and I'll equate Mahomes as to Jordan in this. All right, he he's never going to be Michael Jordan or Patrick Mahomes, but that doesn't mean that the Rockets can't win two championships with Akeem Olajuwon. So we don't need him to be Jordan. He can still win. He can still be Akeem. Now, again, Akeem's a Hall of Famer, too, but oh, yeah. my my analogy is to say that, yeah, they probably should have drafted Mahomes. They probably should have drafted uh, Deshaun Watson, but they didn't. But that doesn't mean now that he's still destined to be a bum and incapable of winning because he won't have the statistics to match those guys. So maybe, the bear, maybe he does the absolute minimum the way Trent Dilfer did with the 2000 Ravens. Mm-hmm. Just the absolute minimum. Just don't fuck it up. And that that's how the Ravens went to a championship. We, just we, just playing okay. And Trent Dilfer was at that time considered a first-round bust when he was in Tampa Bay. That's right. So I would take Mitchell being a bust but still winning any day. Like, I would take that every day of the week. So maybe that's still plausible. Maybe the defense is going to be as good as everybody said, and they, they get enough out of the offense. And if you can win and still say, yeah, but he, he should have done this because he was a second pick in the draft. But if you can still win, I'll take the yeah butts all day. Mm-hmm. Don't care. Mm-hmm. Uh, not to sound like Cutler, but, I mean, there, we still hope that he does enough 
Because you remember how he played against Dallas last year? Sure. He lit them up, but that was the first game like since he'd hurt his shoulder. He seemed to be willing to run, right? Which is a big part of his game. It's huge. And, yeah, and I, I, I don't want to equate him to this guy because he's a Hall of Famer. But just for a moment, he makes me think of like Steve Young when he was in Tampa Bay. Mm-hmm. It, he showed, you know, he had a game, but he couldn't put it together. You know, and and he was on a bad football team. He goes to San Francisco. He's surrounded by Hall of Famers. He finally gets his chance to win the Super Bowl. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but I'm saying they're the same kind of player where, when especially when he was in Tampa, Young basically couldn't do anything but run. Right. So, but it came together later. So what I'm just saying, I'm not saying he's going to be good like Steve Young, but if he can be the guy like Steve Young earlier in his career and he's struggling, but he still put it together later. And I know this is his last shot in Chicago. Uh, he's got to show something to warrant a contract extension. Has to. Yep. Whether that's win a division, win a playoff game, have great statistics, maybe exceed Eric Kramer's 29 touchdowns just as a starter, mm-hmm. uh, you know, for the most touchdowns in a single season for the organization. Something. He's got to deliver something to warrant us keeping him around. But maybe that'll come. I mean, like I said, a lot of times some players struggle early on. Uh, Ron Jaworski was at the Rams before he ever went to the Super Bowl with the Eagles. I mean, there's, there's Jim Plunkett. I mean, there's a lot of quarterbacks that had potential in the event. Phil Simms. Alex the, Smith, Rich Gannon. Yeah. And they, yeah, it's a long list. Absolutely. So maybe you put that together, and, and, and I know I'm going on a tangent here. I'm just saying, but there's a reason to be optimistic. But the thing that bothers me about Sunday is that week one every year is kind of um, – you know, kind of a, a coin toss in terms like, remember a few years ago, the Bears almost beat the Falcons and should have beaten the Falcons in Glennon's first game on opening day. Yes. Even though the Bears themselves haven't won an opening day game since Cincinnati in 2013. Right. But I'm just saying there are usually typically statistically a lot of upsets in week one. And you this year, you're talking about conditioning is going to be huge because yep. you've had very limited practices. You've had no preseason games. So how good is your defense going to be when they haven't hit anybody? There's no way you can tell me that a guy like Robert Quinn or Akeem Hicks, who allegedly are going to be okay, but have been banged up and have basically done nothing, aren't going to be more spent on Sunday than they would be normally. And the same for Khalil Mack, they were the whole team. So I don't expect the defense to play that well uh, on Sunday. I don't think it'll necessarily be the microcosm of you got a rookie at, at corner, or maybe you have screen. I, I don't know, but you're going to have – maybe you'll be a nickel most of the game against Detroit now that I think about it. But still, either way, you're going to have – I think both teams are going to score. And condi- it's going to come down to luck and conditioning. I've think- had no preseason. You've had no hitting. Yeah, there, it, It's like a boxer. You get into a fight, and how did Ali beat Foreman? He let him punch himself out. It's the same scenario. Conditioning is going to, like, you haven't hit anybody. So who's going to be able to hit somebody in the fourth quarter and wrap up when they need to? Well, I, now I'm worried. <laughs> you, you, you ruined my, my optimism. But, well, I'm not trying to, but I'm saying but that could be good, though. It, that could be good for the Bears. Maybe uh, maybe Anthony Miller goes across the middle. Maybe, maybe Cohen goes across the middle, and somebody that ordinarily would make the tackle suddenly doesn't, and, and somebody like Cohen or Patterson just breaks free. Uh, here's here's a reason to be optimistic is we know that it wasn't as Greg Braggs has famously said on this network it's not all on Mitch we know that it was not all on Mitch in 2019 and the fact that this offense did not have healthy tight ends or line a, or, or a line yeah um, but the tight end position from the skill position is so critical to this Matt Nagy at, at, um, Adam, Adam, Andy Reid uh, offense. And so Allen Robinson was asked about the tight end position and what it's doing. What are, this is, are these new tight ends? What are they doing for this offense? And this was his response. Being able to go into the season, you know, with a, a very healthy skill, skill group, you know, in the running backs, tight end and receivers, you know, that's definitely going to pose a challenge for defenses. You know, I think that's something for us. Last year, you know, we weren't able to even go into the season, you know, with 
with with um with a healthy groups across the board, you know. So I think for us that'll be big for us. It's going to be huge, Dan. The fact. Oh, that, I agree. Yeah, and, I agree. I was I was on the Bears or the, I'm sorry, the Barroom Network last mm-hmm. season. Mm-hmm. Shitting on Trey Burton. Uh-huh. I mean, taking a huge shit the way that uh, Antonio, or I'm sorry, Beckham, Odell Beckham would have enjoyed it. He would have loved to have me take that shit on him, apparently. I, I was shitting on Trey Burton, and I was down on Trey Burton. I was kind of hoping for Adam Shaheen, and that, you know, God, he just ended up being a mammoth bust. And, and you're right. Then we had uh, Horstead, who, who came on the Barroom Network. Seems like a nice guy, but that's not the guy you want on the field, yeah. you know, and that's not a shot at him. Um, so, yeah, I, I agree. I, and I think Jimmy Graham, like, it seemed like, again, I'm not the X and, X's and O's guy, and I'm not going to pretend to be the guy that's a master at film. Mm-hmm. I'm just telling you, it seemed like from the novice fan, I am going to just consider myself a fan, it seemed like Jimmy Graham wasn't necessarily put in the same scheme that he was with the saints. Mm-hmm. Like he, he was asked to block a lot more. It seemed like in Seattle and in green Bay, he just kind of didn't mesh either. Right. So I don't know. He dropped a couple of passes, but it, what, what do we know about pace is he idolizes his days with the saints. Right. So I feel like he'll try to put Graham in the appropriate position to basically just be a hybrid receiver playing tight end. Yeah. He'll be our first player doing that since Greg Olson, yeah. or maybe Mart- Martellus Bennett. Uh, it, you know, Marty had a really solid year, absolutely, uh, with I, the Bears at one point. But I think he could be a matchup problem. And then if Komet is as good as everyone thinks, you can run some two tight end sets. Yep. He, and maybe you have Holtz come in and play fullback at the same time or H back. I think you'll see that absolutely. Here's the one thing about these tight ends, and maybe none of them is going to have a better than average season, but at the very least, they're going to demand the attention of the defense. You just cannot line up your defense and say, ignore Jimmy Graham, ignore Cole Komet, ignore these other guys that played a tight end position. You just can't do that, Uh, particularly if they're healthy. And it's important, I think, that one of these tight ends, and it'll probably be Jim Graham, catch a pass in that first or second series to show the defense, all right, these guys have a tight end on this team. We cannot overlook them. And then, of course, the other important part is the running game. And I want to get to that first, but I I want to get to that after I play this soundbite because we kind of glossed over a little bit about the naming of Mitch Trubisky as the starting quarterback. And I wanted to get your opinion on that, but let's first get the opinion of Allen Robinson. And by the way, Dan, did you know that the Barroom Network is in a uh, partnership with the Allen Robinson Within Reach Foundation? Did you know that? I did not. I apologize for not knowing that. Well, I should have known that. It's because this is breaking news. (laughs) Oh, okay. I thought I missed it somewhere. (laughs) Yeah, you didn't attend our last staff meeting. That's why you missed it. Uh, But I'm uh, I'm encouraging everyone uh, to visit the Allen Robinson 12.org org website and you will find out there that that foundation is doing incredible things to help needy children here in the city of chicago our website the bearsbarroom.com and you can also reach it by barroomnetwork.com we'll have a link to that website and lots of information and during the course of the year ryan badgley who leads our efforts with community outreach here at the barroom network he is going to lead the efforts in raffling off autographed Bears Bar Room, Bar Room Network, Within Reach Footballs, autographed by Alan Robinson. We're going to raise some money for the foundation, and we've got some other cool things in, in place for that. But I want to play this soundbite because I thought it was really cool. Alan Robinson talking about uh, his reaction to Mitch Trubisky being named the starting quarterback. Being able to go into the season, you know, with a, a very healthy skill. That's clearly the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> For me training with Mitch early in the spring, you know, going up into leading up into training camp, you know, um, I was out there, you know, all those days with him where he was putting in the work, you know, um, constantly, you know, um, even if it wasn't, you know, uh, some days where it may just be a couple of us out there, you know, so, I mean, to 
to see him start, you know, is not surprising at all. You know, when you put in the work, you get the results, you know, and I saw a lot of the work that he put in, you know, from, from February, March, and even probably some before that, you know, so I saw it put, I saw him put the work in, you know, so, so, I mean, it's not surprising at all that he was able to, you know, uh, really uh, improve his game, how he set out to do. And I, I'm really heartened to hear a Rob say those nice things about Mitch because there were times last year where I thought a Rob was really unhappy with Mitch. And then during the off season, there were some uh, tweets, some posts by on social media from a Rob that perhaps people would have thought that he was uh, trying to recruit quarterbacks to come to Chicago and so forth. And maybe w- I was reading too much into that. I think other people may have been as well. Uh, but I, I'm just happy that he worked out with Trubisky, that he saw how hard he's working, that he's encouraged by the progress, and that the reports, while not glowing about Mitch uh, Trubisky's uh, preseason, are at least somewhat encouraging, That uh, given that, that he's been working on footwork and working on some mechanics and working on the processing. Those are the key things that he really needs to correct in order to be a, a, an above-average quarterback in the NFL. I agree with you. That that's kind of what the the same reaction you had from listening to that sound is the way that I felt emotionally after hearing Bobby Massey speak. It, both of them, again, I I've just paraphrased, but they they both said similar things that like, hey, this guy worked hard, and again, that doesn't mean anything. Like he could be the last guy in the building, the first guy there, and is still if he sucks, he sucks. I get it, but. I mean, at least he's doing those and those things to succeed. Mm -hmm. I mean, you would rather him be, you know, outgoing and gregarious and all these things that the the Cutler wasn't and and hardworking and not to say Jay wasn't hardworking, but, you know, like the, the most of the team seems to like Mitchell. Yeah. And and they're they're commenting that he's working hard. So we'd li- we'd like for him to be doing those things, and he is. So at least he's doing everything he can control to be a good quarterback. And I mean, and that's that's promising. Did you see on Twitter, and he, he deleted the, the tweet, but uh, this is a couple of days ago, and again, I don't have it in front of me, but someone was complaining that Robinson had not received a contract extension. Right. And maybe rightfully so. Mm-hmm. And they somebody commented in the thread like, well, maybe a- Allen Robinson is uh, highballing the Bears. And then uh, he commented back something to the effect of, uh, how can I highball if I haven't even gotten a pitch yet? Ooh! And then he deleted the tweet. I took a sn- I took the screenshot of it. I can send it to you. Wow! I have the screenshot somewhere. Let me see if I can just find the exact yeah. quote. Well, why don't you do that? And I will tell people that DeAndre Hopkins uh, signed an extension. That uh, let's see, I, I've got it here. According to ESPN, this was posted midday on Tuesday. Uh, he has a deal with the Arizona Cardinals, and it is a two-year extension worth fifty-four point five million dollars, including forty-two point five million dollars guaranteed, and that's significant. I, I generally I don't like talking about player salaries. I when I was a kid. We were taught you don't ask anybody what how much they're making. It's rude, and I've I've always felt that way. I don't really care what athletes are making. They let them make as much as they want. But unfortunately, it's become part of the game because of salary caps and so forth. And so for Allen Robinson, this is big news because that's where the negotiations start. You know, they're not gonna he's not gonna make more money than DeAndre Hopkins, but that's where his agent is gonna say, all right, we want a two year extension, and it's gonna be fifty four point five million. Talk me out of it. He's your best receiver. He is the DeAndre Hopkins of the Chicago Bears. And they'll probably, hopefully, please God, settle for somewhere in the area of 45 to $50 million with about 40 of that guaranteed. And I hope it happens soon because I really do believe this uh, guy, Allen Robinson the third, could be the best is it the third or the second? Alan the Rob- second. The, the second. second. My apologies. Uh, he could be the best Chicago Bears wide receiver in the history of the organization. And um, now, I'll, I'll say, pump the brakes on that just just for a mo- just for a moment. Okay. I, I I still I know a lot of people don't like him, but I still would say the best we've had on the field's been Brandon Marshall. 
Um, I, I, I'm not going to argue that. He is the best, but Allen Robinson can surpass him. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's got the capabilities. Yeah. I was just saying, I think he, and we need more. I, I have that tweet that he said, by okay, the way. Uh, the, I took a screenshot of it. It says, how you play hardball with no pitch, laugh out loud, and a picture of a baseball. Wow. I'll send it to you right now. Uh, yeah, so that if you he did delete it, but it seems to me, it, if reading between the lines, the Bears have not made any attempts to re-sign him then based upon that tweet. And if that is true... Oh, my gosh. Maybe all, all I can say is, I, and I'm not trying to, to plagiarize anyone's thinking because I've heard other people say this, mm -hmm. and I, it may even be a bullshit argument, but because of COVID and everything that's happening this year, the salary cap is going to go down next year significantly because the lack of resources that they're going to lose from just ticket sales and parking and concessions and et cetera. It is a business. So the, the salary cap is going to be reduced, so maybe – the Bears may have to re-sign their quarterback, too, or sign another quarterback. Right. Who, who knows? So maybe th th I've been hearing people say it's because of the cap, but I've heard people say that maybe it's because they want him to earn a, a huge deal. Like, let's see it one more time. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not Ryan Pace. Well, let me, let, let me it interrupt It does worry you. me, though. Yeah, it worries the hell out of me, too. Let me interrupt you to say that on the last a Gabriel and Schuster Talk Bears, we're actually recording a new one on Thursday, so the last one that's been posted, there's an interview with a player agent by the name of Mike McCartney, and I asked Mike that question. I said, you know, I've been telling everyone we may not see Allen Robinson sign because of all the ambiguities with what's happening with the salary cap, the uncertainty, and blah, blah, blah. And he said, nope, you're going to see players signed, and I would be surprised if the Chicago Bears don't sign Allen Robinson. He, he didn't say Allen Robinson. He said their star wide receiver to a contract early in the season. And he said, you, 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 the longer you wait, the price goes up. And if, it, if they're still talking in the middle of the year, that's when Allen Robinson and his agents say, well, let's just not agree on anything now because we're close to free agency and let's test those waters. So I got to believe that if we uh, – that oh, he's, here's one other thing Mike McCartney said. He said, you don't worry – about the salary cap because if you want a player, you can figure out a way to get them. Now, I think that's player agent speak, but uh, but I think there's also some truth to that. You know, they'll all have to get rid of some guys to make room, but the, Allen Robinson, in my opinion, is a guy that you got you, you should clear out some space and, and sign this guy because he is very, very important to this offense. I, I agree. The, old, the center, I mean, this is what I was thinking. My honest, bearing my soul, I don't want to be cynical. I don't want to be pessimistic. I don't want to be negative. But then my honest reaction to that was, and I'm not saying this is Ryan Pace thinking that at all. And I'm not, I'm not trying to justify avoiding even exchanging offers with the guy's agent. That's insanity mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. But 2011 was their, their lockout year. Right. And I don't have the stat in front of me, but I read a couple of days ago that injuries, uh, based upon what they consider long-term injuries, meaning at least two to three games missed, were increased by like 48% that season because of the lack of preseason games and because of the contract impasse that they had with the lack of agreement. So now you've got no preseason because of the world, because of the coronavirus, as we know. But again, what if week one, God forbid, you know, he hurts his knee again or something. I'm not saying that that's that it's going to, God, I don't want to bring that into fruition or make that manifest, but maybe again, Pace is just saying, let me just make sure he's going to be okay. We don't have one of these freak injuries because, you know, there was no preseason. There was no hitting. Let's make sure he's going to be well. We don't want to give him a contract and, and then boom, and then he's down. Yeah. I don't, I don't think they, they, they think that way. I mean, DeAndre Hopkins, they, they, were, they, were the Cardinals thinking that? Uh, clearly well, not. Well, Hopkins, again, I love Allen Robinson, but Hopkins is, you know, I mean, I'm not going to say he's as good as Larry Fitzgerald in his prime, but pretty damn close. Like, mm -hmm. Hopkins, to me, is, is, is an elite player who could eventually be in the Hall of Fame. 
I'm not saying Allen Robinson isn't a player, mm -hmm. but we're always ranking quarterbacks so who's top tier. I think Allen Robinson is probably in the, in the second tier, which makes him extremely solid and worthy of his contract. I'm not shitting on him, but Hopkins is a is elite. I think I'm not saying Robinson is an elite. I'm just saying, but he could be a Hall of Famer. I think I, you're starting to piss me off, Dan. <laughs> okay, I think Hopkins. I, I'm so glad Hopkins. It's so fucking stupid of the Texans just to trade him because oh the coach gosh. didn't like him. Yes. I'm just so glad he wasn't traded to Minnesota or Green Bay or Detroit. Thank you, thank you. But I I do believe that. Allen Robinson is in that bottom of tier one, and I think he would convincingly be in tier one for in everybody's eyes if he would have had a more reliable quarterback and an offensive line. I mean, there were so many things wrong with the offense in 2019, but he definitely was not it. Oh, I agree. I agree. <laughs> I, I just think Hopkins is, like I said, is just as – you know, just he's just special. Better play. He's a better player, I think. But that doesn't mean Robinson isn't solid. And if you can get anything, if Anthony Miller can justify being a second round pick, or, or wasn't he second round pick too? Yes. Yeah, like Shaheen. But so if he can live up to his second round stature, mm -hmm. and again, you have a tight end. If you have a wide receiver that they have to worry about too, then maybe you have Cohen in the formation. And then Robinson, maybe he's going to get single coverage. Mm. So, I mean, if you can give him some help, like the quarterback's got to make the throw. But, yeah, imagine how good he would be if he had help. Yeah. I mean, I, like last season, he was the basically the only Bears receiver. Right. Exactly. So yeah, that's how good he was last year. Exactly. I don't want to. I don't want to contradict myself. I think he's a solid player, and I really hope that they re-sign him. Uh, they're are very few wide receivers, if any, that are better against a zone defense than Allen Robinson. He knows how to find those openings in the zone, and he is, is, is simply magnificent against zone. And then on one-on-one -on -one matchups, he doesn't have the blazing speed. He's not to beat anybody, but he has excellent ability to box players out to make that point that catch at the high point and, and just out wrestle defensive backs yeah and the footwork on the sidelines yes he has tremendous like where, when you have to drag your feet right and you, you like a Lynn Swan kind of thing yep you know like uh, he's no way he's gonna land in bounds and he does yep I, um, he's he's very graceful on the sidelines. Yeah, I, he, he really, really is, and and he's a such a great positive influence in the locker room too. He's just a cool guy, great with the community and so forth. You got to reward guys like that. No, keep, I agree. I agree. I don't want you to think that. I was just thinking, like I said, I think Hopkins is just could be a Hall of Famer. Maybe Robinson is too. I'm just saying. I just think Hopkins is, you know, like earned that money so far. Mm -hmm. and, and I want Robinson to earn that money too. Absolutely. And I hope he gets that money. So I'm a fan and I, he has my respect. Uh, I, like I said, I wasn't shitting on him with the Brandon Marshall thing either. I just think, okay, let's see it again. All right. Let's see it again. Like I know Marshall was with the, the Bears only three seasons, but statistically, I mean, was, they were the best seasons in Bears history yep. for a wide receiver. He's stupendous. He truly was. It's too bad that he had this – you know, borderline personality disorder because it, it made him a bad t teammate. But uh, on the football, did you see field, what happened to him in Florida? Mm, remind me, because I think I did, but I'm forgetting. Oh my God! I don't want to make it in about politics, but he had, he apparently had bought a house in Florida mm -hmm. and was going into his own house, and the police. Uh, didn't I guess they weren't used to seeing affluent. African American males in this community, uh -huh. and the police, the he, the whole thing's on Twitter. Uh, they made a big scene. He's like, "I'm trying to go into my own house," and they basically were intimating that he was, you know, a thief or a, it was a burglary or it it was bullshit. It was complete and utter bullshit. It's a symptom a, a symptom of everything else that's going on in the world. But yeah, it happened to Brandon Marshall recently, and it's on Twitter. Wow, I I missed that. I I not seen that, so we'll have to look into that. Um, all right, I want to change the subject to something that we've been touching on. but really, The running backs. You got it. And so I am just going to say that all off season long, I have been so worried about the lack of depth at the yes. running back position. And then lo and behold, 
David Montgomery suffers an injury and the social media world just went crazy because he was carted off the field. It was a non-contact injury and so forth. And now he might be ready to go week one or maybe week two. But nonetheless, I'm still worried about the lack of depth. And I know you've had some thoughts because you were very yeah. disappointed about Leonard Fournette. Not yeah, even and that's why I was going to say uh, I, I, I was shocked at what you're saying because you, you seem to be – and disagreement, which was fine. That's that's part of the fun of it, mm-hmm. that we disagreed with each other on Fournette. Let me just say, because I expect the Fournette to be brought up, I did look at his pro football reference. And he had 76 catches last year for 522. Mm. And he rushed for 1,152 yards with three touchdowns. Wow. He had nine touchdowns in 2017. He was hurt in 18. Right. But I keep hearing Hub Arkish on the radio whenever the Bears or Bears callers suggest that you know, we should have signed Fournette when when he was available. Mm-hmm. I, this guy's a bust. That's a bust? Rushing for 1,152 yards and catching 76 balls? Give me that bust all fucking day. And I don't understand why as a Bears fan, for a Bears fan for, you know, my entire life, if, if I consider 87 my first season, then we're going on like my 34th year as a fan here, season-wise. And I... Through my life, it seems like the Bears have only had a couple of like power backs, mm-hmm. and I don't understand that. Like Anthony Thomas had a, a little a short run as as dominating in two thousand one as a rookie, and probably didn't live up to it again. And I, Brad Muster never lived up to that. He was more finesse. You know, Jordan Howard had a solid two seasons, and then before you know it, he's gone. Like, I don't know why we can't have a guy like Fournette. Like, I always bring up this analogy from the NBA, but I think it's true. Like, Pat Riley won championships running Showtime with the Lakers. Mm -hmm. And then he went to the Knicks and took the Knicks to the finals because he realized, hey, I don't have magic here. I don't have worthy here. So I'll change my coaching to match my personnel. I don't know why we can't get a power back and just tweak the offense a little bit. It's just always like, oh well, we got to get rid of Greg Olson. He's not he's not part of our offensive scheme. We got we we can't have Jordan Howard. It doesn't fit our scheme. Why can't you take a guy like Leonard Fournette who was available? You know, you can assign to a, a very least a one year deal. You bring him in and you see what you got because you could lose. Tariq Cohen's probably going to be gone after next year. You don't know what you have with David Montgomery. I know a lot of people think very highly of him. He didn't do well last year. But again, we know the tight end, the offensive line, the quarterback, the offense as a whole wasn't that good. But what makes us think that David Montgomery is is Walter Payton here? Like I, I don't have any confidence in that. And so I think you signed a guy like Fournette. Yeah, you say he's not our off. Fuck, man. Bring in Holtz. You got a third and one. Run the ball. You lead block for him. But it, Nagy always wants to run like a fucking triple reverse to get one yard, which drives me nuts. We can run the ball, too. You know, I don't know why the Bears can't do the easy things like run a third down and one just dive right up the fucking middle. Dan, does it worry you that Leonard Fournette is a dick? <sighs> there are a lot of people that. I mean, I know everyone's going to say, well, it didn't work with the Bears, with Mar- Martellus and, and Brandon Marshall. But, I mean, a lot of people say color was a dick. I mean. It was. <laughs> well, I, I just. And he, and he wa- didn't win. Here, here's here's uh, from NBC I Sports. I just want to win. I just want to win. NBC Sports is reporting that it sounds like Leonard Fournette's decision to join Tampa Bay was mainly influenced by Tom Brady's presence and his own personal frustrations with his past in Jacksonville. Just check out this quote from F- that Fournette delivered on Tuesday. He said, for the first time in my life, I really have a quarterback. And last year he was taking snaps from Nick Foles. From Nick Foles, <laughs> exactly. By the way, Nick Foles did beat Tom Brady in the Super Bowl, but maybe yeah, Leonard yeah, Fournette yeah. didn't watch that game. <laughs> So I I don't know. I mean, I I like Leonard Fournette as a player, but there's just something about that guy. There are reports that he was disliked in the locker room. The coaching staff 
thought that he was lazy and they would ask him to do things and he would, you know, mumble and 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 you don't want that those kind of players in your okay. locker room. Now there's Devontae Freeman out there. Oh, okay, that's what I was gonna say. What about the old the old Falcons? Man? I I think that there's some really good players still available in free Spencer agency. Ware. Spencer yes. Ware knew the system with the Chiefs. Yes. I would love for them to bring in now here's here's the thing that I am one of the things that I'm gonna be looking for Sunday against the Detroit Lions is to see what design they have for this running attack and how Cordero Patterson is going to fit into that. I got this feeling that because Matt Nagy loves innovation, that he's going to have Fournette and Tariq Cohen, and if Montgomery plays, if not Montgomery, then Ryan Nall, he's going to use them in a combination of formations, formations that probably we haven't seen much of in the past. He's going to that, have- That's my point, though. That's See, to me, Coach Nagy, God, my biggest opposition with Matt Nagy is as follows. Mm-hmm. I feel like there are a lot of people, again, I'm in a right-wing state. I don't want to besmirch all Trump supporters. And if you're listening and you're a Trump supporter, I'm not saying this is everybody. So please grant me that. There are a lot of people here, though, that their whole like liking of Trump is because he's a tough guy. I like him. He's just tough. And that's such bullshit. But it's like this... This aura, they think that he projects toughness, mm-hmm. but it's really all. In my my theory is it's to hide insecurity. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, the reason I say that is I think Nagy is insecure about his intelligence. I'm not saying that he's that he's dumb by any stretch. He's, he could be a brilliantly intelligent man, but he's so insecure about it. He wants you to know, God damn it, he's smarter than you and he's smarter than everybody else in the fucking room. And he will bring out this fucking you know, formation where there's four tight ends on the field at the same time. Just some crazy shit. Like, it's, it's a third and one, man. Run the fucking ball. Yeah. Like, he overly, he complicates things just so he can compensate for, like, a small cock or something here. It's like when a guy gets a huge fucking a Ford F-350 and I've got all these AR rifles because my dick is fucking tiny. That, I feel like that's Nagy. Like, he's, like, compensating for small dick, so he's got to be, he's got to be super smart and he's got to outsmart you and he's got to be trickery and fuck, man, run the ball. That's why I wanted Fournette. Just hand the ball. Give me a back that can run the ball. Now, with the, so he's gone. He's history. Fuck Leonard Fournette. But we don't even know if David Montgomery is going to be good, and now you're putting a groin injury on him. A- AP is a guy that is beating his kids and is not necessarily a good man either, but we're going to see him Sunday. The Lions picked him up immediately. Maybe we should have signed AP, just a guy that could contribute, like, I feel even if Montgomery is our number one back at some point, like you said, depth, like Cohen's going to be gone in my opinion. Yeah. And Patterson is, I like him, but he could be gone after next year too. And he's a gimmick guy, clearly. And th- and I like Ryan. No, I like perseverance. I like the guy like, like Waddle, not because they're both white, but just because they both have been on the practice squad, have been cut. And you want to see a guy get rewarded for just his 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 lack of quit mm-hmm. and just fuck it. I'm going to keep going, you know. So I'd like to see Nall be good, but what if he isn't? You know, like what if he had two carries last year? None were memorable. It's just no big deal. But what if what if we don't have a running game Sunday? And maybe uh, this is really going off the path here, but maybe. They didn't sign a back because Nagy wants to throw the ball 55 times anyway. And yeah. he'll use Montgomery's injury as a crutch to say, well, you know, we had to pass because we couldn't run the ball. If, uh, we d- if that's tr- true, and if I get the sense that that is true, I, I started the Firefox campaign here at the Bears Ballroom Network three years ago, four years ago, whenever it was, I will start the uh, nail Nagy to the cross uh, campaign because you just cannot win in pro football. I know it's a passing league now, but you got to have a running game because remember the saints game. Yeah. Seven Uh, carries. How, how can I forget? I mean, that, that's one of the, that ranks up there with one of the biggest disappointments, one of the biggest pimples in, in Bears history. You and weren't they to, coming off a bye? Yeah, they were coming off a bye. You're right. That was your game plan for two weeks? Yeah. 
uh, well, and, and I understand that sometimes during the course of the game, you know, you, you see things and so you start changing the game plan and so forth. But at a certain point, you got to have your senses or you got to have an assistant coaching staff that says, hey, coach, we've only run the ball five times and it's in the third quarter already. You, you got to fucking you got to fucking realize that something isn't working. It, 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 right. And, I agree. You don't want to be Fox here. We're not trying to say that you run, run, you right. pass, you punt. Yes, like the 2017 Bears. We're not saying Nagy needs to run every first down and every second down, but give us something in the middle between Fox, hmm. between Fox, Tressman, and Nagy, some middle ground because Tressman didn't want to run either. Yeah, well, and Fox it, didn't want to pass. And doesn't it seem like we go from one extreme, extreme as a coach? To another. To, yeah, it's like why? Why can't we just get a guy that is good at everything? I the next head coach for the Chicago Bears, and I hope we don't have one for many, many, many years. I hope Matt Nagy succeeds. But the next head coach, I really would like to see a CEO type head coach who are he. Uh, delegates the defense to the defensive coordinator. He delegates the offense to the offensive co- coordinator. He delegates the special teams to the special teams coordinator. And he meets equally with all three. And he manages the team from the top. And he's motivating players so that at, be- at the beginning of every game, the team comes out ready to hit, ready to catch, ready to run. And so many times we have not seen that with a Matt Nagy team. All I see is him buried into his Waffle House menu play calling sheet, and yep. and and that tells me that hey, dude, you're you're not really the head coach. You know this is not right. I don't. You know I know there's been very successful head coaches who are offensive coordinators and call the plays. Andy Reid being one, but. I, I, Even Ray, Reed told he, that's how Nagy became the coach. Right. He gave the job to Nagy to call the play. So maybe Nagy says, "Look, I, I know DeFilippo wasn't successful in Minnesota, but in Philly he was as a coordinator. Or is that was he the quarterback coach in Philly when uh, they won the Super Bowl? He was correct. Uh, okay, so it's got to be a guy he trusts. He's worked with him before. He hired him now. So maybe you take a guy that you." Maybe Mark Helfrich and he didn't. Maybe they bumped heads. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But maybe he says, I know D. Filippo's the guy from the system. He believes the same shit that I do. So maybe Nagy, you should allow him to call the place because he knows he, he can trust him. They're from the same wavelength. So why not? I agree with you, man. You, you should, he should probably relinquish that responsibility. Yeah. I mean, and his- be more of a coach. You know, like, I, I know no one's going to, a lot of people shit on him. But that's the thing I always thought about Lonnie was that the Bears, again, they did a lot of losing during once this time. So I'm not trying to say Lonnie was Ditka or even better or whatever. But I can say this, when the year that Kramer in 95 was so successful, and now we're going to touch on Eric in a minute, but uh, they were throwing the ball. They had Conway, they had Graham, and then whenever, like in 94, when Kramer's hurt, when Steve Walsh is in there, he's running the ball. He's more heavy set with Raymond Harris because he realizes Walsh doesn't have the arm as Kramer. So I thought Wani represented the kind of guy that was he coached to his strength. Uh, hold, hold on a second. Where, where is that coming from? That's not me. No, that was me. I apologize. Okay. Well, I was just going to say, why, I was like, is that your way of telling me to wrap it up? I was saying, <laughs> why, Wani, I felt that the Bears always played hard for him. Absolutely. Even, even when they were four and twelve, they were like, like I remember ninety eight specifically. His last season, mm-hmm. they had a lead in like the fourth quarter of like the first, you know, four, five, six losses or whatever. It's just like, and then Kramer got hurt. You know, and they always came out playing hard for him, and he seemed to run when he needed to and pass when he needed to. And I'm not saying we need to hire Dave once. No, I'm no, just saying no. somebody like that that that's willing to pass when. Your quarterback's hot and willing to run when you need to run. Right, I, I'm I'm totally with you. I remember telling a couple of my buddies, you know what, you know, Juan said isn't winning as as a Bears coach, but I do respect the fact that this team always seems to play hard for him, and 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 that is worth something. At least we weren't getting embarrassed like the Mark Trestman teams, where it was clear that the defense 
hated his guts. He came in there and he, 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 all he did was talk about the quarterback position, quarterback position, quarterback position. And the defense was just so pissed off and they had lost. The defense had lost Lovey Smith, a coach that they loved dearly. And Tressman did nothing to try to earn their trust uh, other than allowing Lance Briggs to miss the opening Open day. Open his of- restaurant. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, you know, just some really stupid things. Uh, Mark Tressman was just not a leader of men. Don't and- you think Ryan Pace always talking about, yeah, you know, the, the quarterback room is so good. It just it feels like something Tressman would have said. Uh, you know, we've got such a good tight end room. We've got a tight end. We've got a quarterback room and a running back room. And our kicking room is just so good this year. It's like everything's the room. Yes. That sounds like something Tressman would have said. Oh, my gosh. Tressman had, had the greatest cliches. The uh, What was it? The toolbox? The... Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I won't even get there. But you mentioned quarterback, and and that kind of is a good segue to the Eric Kramer story you wanted to share. And yeah. I also have this audio clip from the Score Sports Radio. You you still want me to play that? Yeah, yeah, I think it's great. I can set it up if you want me to. Please, or we please, can... please do so. Okay, so for a lot of people, they may or may not know uh, Eric Kramer's story, but he uh, was a from North Carolina State. I, I think he was undrafted. Mm-hmm. I, by 1991, he gets his chance to play. He leads uh, the Lions to the NFC Championship, uh, riddling the Cowboys 38-6 to in the playoffs. And Barry Sanders was a decoy that day. He threw for 300 yards. But they go, they lose the title game to, the, to, uh, to Washington the next week. And by 92, they already have Rodney Pete back in there. By 93, he, he, because of injury, he's back in, leads Detroit to the playoffs again, uh, and he leads the Lions to a drive to win the game against the Packers, but with like 30 seconds to go, far fits Shannon Sharp, or Sterling Sharp for the go-ahead touchdown, and now Kramer's a free agent in the Bears signing. Uh, he gets hurt in 94. We win a playoff game with Steve Walsh. The next year, they have a competition. Kramer wins it. And has the best season statistically for a Chicago Bear, you know, ever. Yeah. Uh, for most touchdowns. 96, he breaks his neck. 97, 98, the teams are just so bad. And we traded for Rick Meyer. And needless to say, the rest of Kramer's tenure is unspectacular. Unbeknownst to, to him, it's not necessarily his fault. After he retires, he... Uh, he becomes extremely depressed because his son, he's mentoring his son. His son is a star quarterback in high school. His son overdoses on heroin and dies. Hmm. His mom dies. He gets divorced. All that within like a year. So he gets to the point where he says, fuck life. And he works on, he teaches himself how to shoot a gun. He's take, going to ranges and he gets his finances in order and he shoots himself. Oh, and. Gosh. After killing himself, presumably, he somehow survives. He, he's in a hospital for a solid year. Now, the, where we'll pick up with the interview, the all the people, the specialists that he saw said, look, it'll probably be four years or so before your, all your faculties are back. Like you're, you're running, you're lifting weights, but like he had no short-term memory whatsoever. He could remember, he could talk to you about the 1991 Lion playoff game, but he couldn't tell you what he did five minutes ago. So having said that, this piece is talking about this woman who comes into his life and realizes he has all these mental faculties that aren't working. Uh, His acuity isn't there. And she's stealing from him. He doesn't realize it. And ultimately, his sister and his friend are just on it. They're like, man, she's really manipulating and taking his money and he's just completely oblivious to it. So the woman finds out about that, that they know, and she secretly forces Eric to get married to her. So again, Kramer is like Dustin Hoffman and Rain Man at this point. So it's a crime to coerce him into, to marriage when he has no idea what he's doing, Mm -hmm. no clue. And eventually, uh, he's, he's, he's well now. They've charged this lady with 12 felonies, but he wants his name cleared because whenever he said, fuck this, I know what's going on now. I don't want to be married to you. Then she accuses him of domestic violence. And like Kramer says, everybody 
heard the story where I was allegedly violent, but nobody heard the story where I was cleared. So anyway, this soundbite with Dan B- Bernstein is uh, a segment. The interview was 30 minutes, but I cut it down to about four or five minutes. And it's Kramer talking about just this nightmare that he's had with this woman that's stealing his money and coercing him into marriage. And, uh, hey, if you're ready to hit the soundbite, I feel like I've set it up the best I can. You did. You did an ex- Extraordinary job, as you always do when you're telling stories. Let's go to that WSCR 670 Score Sports Radio interview, Dan Bernstein and Eric Kramer. The very last part of Dan Wetzel's uh, wonderful and harrowing story here is is where I want to start. And, and as you are looking to, to a new future, and your quote is, I'm walking through the wreckage and rubble of my life, but at least I feel normal walking through it. What does normal feel like? So there was... Quite a bit of time, I'd say about three or four years after I had this traumatic brain injury, it was like walking through a fog at times. And then now I honestly do feel like uh, brain wise back to normal. I hate to make light of it, but despite a bullet going through my brain, uh, I'm still here and, you know, and talking to the neuropsychologist that uh, is an expert in traumatic brain injuries, he was saying, you know, it's about the four-year period, it's about the right time, four- to five-year period, when you start feeling back to normal. So a friend of mine that I went to high school with, her name is Anna Durgan. Uh, we've been friends, obviously, since we we're about 17 or 18. She's really the one that discovered everything. And then my aunt and my sister were also, um, you know, in the middle of all this stuff. Suffice it to say that the theft part began in April of 2016. It was discovered by Anna in, I, I want to say it was mid-October of 2016. So Courtney came into my life at two of the most vulnerable times you could ever have. One was following the death of my son Griffin. I was living with my sister and her two kids in the Las Vegas area, which is about four hours from where I live by car. Courtney was apparently calling me nonstop. The entire time, and I was out there for two months. I don't remember any of it. And then she drives home, drives, flies out, drives me home in my car, and four days later is stealing from me. And then so, went w- and went out of her way to also, w- without your knowledge, essentially without your your legal consent, decides to marry you to to change all the legal angles and make it more difficult to untangle all this stuff. There you go. She got married. She coerced the marriage in, out of me. The neuropsychologist who I had gone to see prior to, it was, I think I saw him two days prior to the detective coming to see me. Um, he had declared me as uh, medically and financially incapacitated, which means I could not, I was not allowed to make medical decisions for myself. I was not allowed to make financial decisions and control my own finances. And I was also not allowed to sign any legal documents. Well, guess what a legal document is? A marriage certificate. She coerced the marriage, and the marriage itself was a crime. So how important is it to you that she stand trial instead of come to a plea agreement? 100% uh, important to me. I do not want this going to a plea deal. But here's the other issue. I tell Courtney I'm getting a divorce. She then calls 911 and claims falsely that uh, uh, charges, so I get charged and arrested for domestic violence. So I'm in jail for a day without my credit card, without my wallet, without my keys. She steals $18,700 in four days. She goes to spend three days at the Four Seasons, even though there's a restraining order keeping me out of my own house for two and a half months. Domestic violence charge has been dropped, as you said. So I need to clear my name still. She made three written declarations where I threw a couple things. She's saying I threw a couple things. So if the police show up, wouldn't there be pictures of those two things on the ground somewhere? And in another declaration written under penalty of perjury, she also said I toppled over a chair in the backyard. Well, wouldn't there be a picture of that in the police photos? It never happened. It's been dropped. But 
it's not been dropped the way I want it dropped. It, it, it does sound like there's still an uphill battle for justice to be done. There, that's a good way to put it. They're happy with these 12 felony char- charges they have against Courtney, but that's really maybe 75% of her crime. And in the meantime, my reputation is soiled on this domestic violence charge. You know, there was no story that the domestic violence charge was dropped. There was a hell of a story when it was when I was charged and arrested. Eric Kramer is our guest on Sports Radio 670, the score of the former Bears quarterback. What? Are, how are your your memories of the all the time previous your your football memories? Are, are those still intact, or is that does, does that seem like almost a, a different person at this point? My long term memory in the earlier days of my life, playing football, growing up, high school, whatever. That's all intact. Kind of weird, but that's how it's, that's how I sit today. One of the things I had to cut just for time, he said that the police were telling him, well, you know, Eric, uh, she only stole $50,000, and you did well, and you saved well. Oh, I mean, God. you've got plenty of money. Oh, my he was like, what God. fucking difference does that make? It's the point. Uh, and another thing he said was that they think because of COVID, they won't actually put her in jail because it's a white collar crime and he's like okay fine but like he like he was saying there the main thing is he wanted to be clear to that domestic violence because he thought that maybe he could coach again in high school you know or something like that and right now if they think that he's abused women who's going to hire him that's unbelievable yeah i gotta tell you eric kramer is one of my favorite all-time chicago bears quarterbacks and that's maybe not saying much but when he had those magnificent seasons those record-breaking seasons with the with the bears i just loved the guy he was the first time i i I gotta believe other than jim mcmahon that was the first time where i i said to myself well the bears really have a quarterback here this guy is damn good and i will never forget the image of him and you probably recall this much better than i do because your recall is outstanding there was a game where he was lifted in the middle of the game uh, i think it was in the third quarter he heads over to the sideline and there's a close-up of him and he's smiling almost as if he's laughing about that and, and almost as if he was not upset at being lifted i don't know if you recall that and so the, a day or two later, I turn on to uh, the Score Sports Radio, which they were, again, nice enough uh, to loan us the use of that clip. And uh, Dan McNeil asked him about that, asked Eric about that. And he did it in a disrespectful way and said, you know, I, I just he basically he said something like, you know, I just have a problem with the fact that you were smiling after being lifted out of the game and playing so poorly. What was there to smile about? And Kramer, to his credit, kept his cool and said, listen, you don't know what I was smiling about. I don't know why you would uh, attempt to come to a conclusion that I I was happy that I was lifted. I frankly can't recall while I was smiling, but I certainly wasn't happy that I was lifted from the game. I was disappointed. And so if the camera catches me for two or three seconds smiling about something or even laughing, then, you know, that's just what it was. It, It wasn't any disrespect to my team and my teammates and so forth and so dan mcneil who i uh, i i appreciate and and respect he's had a great broadcasting career here in chicago but that's one of the a handful of times where he's just said something really stupid and should have instead asked what were you smiling about as opposed to making a value judgment on kramer i think kramer is a decent man and has had some terrible luck and i'm glad that you shared that clip with us because despite the fact that he's gone through this horrible thing with uh this woman courtney beard he did sound really good for a guy that you know was has been having all these brain issues and 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 such terrible health issues he did sound good 
Yeah, he now to be fair, I didn't have the Sunday ticket until the 2000 season, so I did I was dependent on what games that I would get here which predominantly would be that football team in Washington without a team name, I guess, mm. and uh, Pittsburgh. So mm-hmm. I I don't recall that specific game and I would imagine with deductive reasoning it was sometime in 1997 because 95 he started every game, took every snap. Uh, 94, he got hurt when Walsh went in and was, yeah, he was kind of ineffective, but in 98, he got hurt. So I'm thinking he probably got lifted for Rick Meyer because the bears traded a first round pick for him and thought that he was going to, you know, Kramer broke his neck in 96. So they thought he was done Mm -hmm. and he came back. So I'm assuming it was in 97. They were four and 12 that year. I didn't get, but maybe three or four games that whole season, which was horrible. Yeah. So uh, when you're losing and you don't know what's going on. Yeah, uh, but yeah, to talking about his health, you're right. He says that he doesn't feel depressed or like in terms of a suicide. He said, ironically, that portion of what you would think is like, am I suicidal ended when he shot himself because now he feels grateful that he survived. Uh, and he's just now getting all of his mental faculties, which again, Eric alleges that the neurosurgeon said would take four years or so to come back as a result of the injuries he sustained when he shot himself. So he sounds like he's back. And if you remember, he worked uh, the Bears preseason games for a long time. That's too, right. Was it? Yeah. The color analyst. I, I, I always like Kramer. I told you this offline and I sent you the pictures. The first ever jersey that I ever bought, because again, I didn't work yet. I didn't get my first job until I was a senior in high school. And following the 97 season, they had cut Meyer, who threw zero touchdowns with the Bears. You give him a first-round pick, get a guy who throws no touchdowns. It's amazing. But um, so Bears. <laughs> but to defend the Bears on that, at least he was rookie of the year in 1993 at the Seahawks. People forget that he did have one solid rookie season and was rookie of the year. But um, my, uh, Eric Kramer, I bought his jersey, and, and there was no NFL shop then. And uh, the internet was, you know, dial up and – it was just so hard, but I, I did. I don't even think we had Google yet. It's like through like probably like asking Jeeves, <laughs> I figured I got the number of a shop in Chicago. I only wish I remember the name of the place. So I called them and I said, hey, can you do an authentic jersey? And uh, they said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I ordered, I set up the order over the phone and I, I mailed them a money order which is like, what is it, 1980? What, what year is this? So they give me their address. I they, I tell them I'm mailing it. I'll send it uh, overnight or two or three, whatever it was. It, they, they got it relatively soon, and I had a tracking number and all that shit. So they get it, and uh, I paid $180 for an authentic jersey back then. I had to customize it, again, for Eric Kramer. And I ordered it late summer, early before the 98 season started. It was a big deal. He said, I didn't work yet. And I'd saved a lot of, mowed a lot of lawns, you know, to get that money. And by like October, I'm like, where the fuck is my Jersey? You know? So I mean, I know they said it would be like three to six weeks, but come on, you know? (laughs) So I'm calling them back and they're like, oh, oh, we mailed it. And eventually by like November, I still haven't gotten. And they're like, oh, well, it must be lost in the mail. And I'm like, that's it. I gave you $193. I paid like $13 for shipping. So I go to the bank and I, I take my money. Where I'm like, look, they, they, I, I never got the jersey, never got the, you know. So the bank gives me my money back. They give me my $193 back, whatever. And uh, within like a week, seemingly, the jersey arrives. The jersey arrives. And by this time, Kramer's played his last game with the Bear because he's hurt and he's out for the year and he's going to get cut uh, bef- before the next training camp. And so I've got this Eric Kramer just I called the company in Chicago and I'm like, look, I got my money back. I need to probably pay you again. They're like, uh, you know, it shows that you paid it here. And I'm like, but I got it. I got my money back and I got the Jersey and like, they just didn't give a fuck. <laughs> How nice. <laughs> so I, I eventually got this Jersey for free and I, I sent you the, the pictures of it. Uh, right. and I still have it. Like, it, unfortunately it's a little bit tight in the stomach area now, you know, like, what, but what are you weighing uh, nowadays? <laughs> Dan? Well, it's weird. You know, like all jokes aside, like I can still wear, like, let's say a, a bears t-shirt that I bought when Dick Jerron was coach, mm-hmm. like an extra, I can wear an extra large from 2000 for real. Mm-hmm. 
But if it's a shirt that I buy today, especially if it's that shit that's supposed to like not the perspira- uh, perspiration and yeah. rain, like those are so tight. Yeah. Like I need like a 3X for those. <laughs> but I can wear an extra large from 2000. But if I buy an extra large today, it might as well be a, a, a something a stripper is going to go out and show in her entire stomach. <laughs> so and in the old days I could wear extra large or 2x and the stuff I bought that was extra large back then I can still wear. But today if I buy something I want it to be at least 3x. There you I go. I mean I don't know if it, maybe I'm bi- I am bigger. I mean I'm still uh, I'm 6'5 and around 300. Did you ever play and, offensive line? Yeah, yeah, I played football. Oh wow. Um, I was a right tackle. That's so- and um yeah, so the I was just going to say the 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 point is um I, you know, I'm got more belly than I'm happy about, but I mean, overall, I'm still the same waist size. I can still wear the same jeans that I wore back then. Jesus. Like I've had, I've had a 38 or 40 waist my entire life. So you're one of those guys that uh, is showing his ass crack uh, more often than not. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I'm very, very, I, I'm worried about it. I always, I don't want my ass to show. So no, I, uh, I make sure my belt is tight and my shorts aren't coming down. I wear shorts all year round though. <laughs> like, I don't, I usually don't get cold. So at least my legs. All right. We got to talk about Brian Erlacher before we say goodbye. Right? Yeah. I have been telling you and anybody else you who have. listen, I, I am not a Johnny come lately. It's everyone can kick Brian Erlacher now. I've been kicking Erlacher for years. <laughs> I will tell you why if you want to know. I well, mean, be, like I said, I can- be, before you say that, I, I will say this about Erlacher. I, I think he was prematurely put into the Hall of Fame. I'm glad that he made it to the Hall of Fame. I'm glad when any, any Chicago Bear player, and you made me aware of some of the things that he's done after I celebrated his Hall of Fame, but I will say this about his playing career. While he was a stupendous sideline to sideline linebacker and a third safety back there, he allowed Lovey Smith's cover two defense to flourish because he was essentially, he could drop back in a hurry and play that uh, third safety. And it, all you had to do if you were the opposing team is run the ball right at him, and he yep. just could not stop the run, Jerome. How Bettis. many times did Corey Schlesinger yep. or uh, Jim Kleinsaucer, mm-hmm. those are the fullbacks from Detroit and Minnesota, respectively, of that early Erlacher era, just fucking pumble him? Yep. And I would argue, honestly, that I thought Erlacher would have been, again, he made the Hall of Fame, so mm-hmm. fuck. I mean, he did he did all right. I thought he would have been more productive if Greg Blosh would have stayed around and he would have been more in that defensive scheme because he would have picked up a lot more sacks. He would have statistically, under the other scheme, I think he would have had a resume that jumped off the screen versus that cover two where, like you said, he's just drifting back. And he made the Hall of Fame first ballot so he can tell us to suck his dick. But I don't think he deserved it either. He was never in Ray Lewis's category. But, it, but it, I, it, let me let me say this before you get into sure. your story about Erlacher. You know, just like I, I, I said about uh, Lovey Smith and buddies being, you know, his assistant coaches being buddies and so forth. With all due respect to Dan Pompey, it, it, he Erlacher got into. Because of Dan's Because of Dan's, advocacy. exactly. You know, Dan is a great storyteller, and he so he's myth-building with Erlacher. And again, I, I think Erlacher deserves to be in the Hall of Fame, but not as a first ballot Hall of Famer. He got in there because of the respect that Dan Pompey has with that Hall of Fame committee. Now, I got that off my chest. No, I agree, and I will say the only other thing uh, I'm talking about Erlacher's play now versus what I'm about to jump into. Mm -hmm. Uh, Erlacher, you talked to full. I talked about, and you agreed the fullbacks burying him coming out of the backfield and running straight at him, and he never could get off those blocks. It seemed, but later in his career, it it was so frustrating, especially against Green Bay, Mm -hmm. because uh, by the time Rodgers took over for Favre. And again, Erlacher's still playing at a high level. And again, he's older at that point, so I don't want to take anything away from him. But he's still running that cover two, he being Lovey. And what would happen is Rodgers would all – because Lovey's cover two was like, you know where we're going to be at all times. Mm -hmm. 
and we're better than you, but we're not better than you anymore. So they always hit that zone behind Urlacher and before the safety. And there was always Randall Cobb or, you know, Greg Jennings going through there in between behind Urlacher, but in front of Major Wright or whatever, whomever was playing safety at that exact moment in time. But that's how, and they always slanted us to death too, because Lovey wouldn't play press. So it's like the, the quick slant and the route behind Urlacher. Right. Always open. Yep. Always fucking open. Go back and watch the 2010 championship game all the way down the field, 7 nothing. Always happened. They scripted their first 15 plays or whatever. They knew where the Bears were going to be, and they always fucking scored on us as soon as they played us. It was it was maddening. But to get to Urlacher, I was a huge fan early on. He didn't he doesn't start to like week five. I think the the first game that they win in 2000 in uh, Green Bay, uh, Cade McNown taking down Brett Favre. Yep. Um, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure that was Urlacher's first start. So by 2001, you know, I'm like, this dude is fucking fantastic. You know, like he's fast. He's all over the field. You know, like I bought his jersey after the 2000 season. I was his fan. Love the 01 team. They put Ted Washington up front and Keith Trailer, and they kept those backs off of him. And then the Bears are 13 and three. As you know, the story by 04, Lovey's the coach and they run a piece in Sports Illustrated where the other players say that he's the most overrated player in the league. But by 05, he's the defensive player of the year. 06, he has that great game against the Cardinals. They go to the Super Bowl, you know. But by 07, that's when he, I, I start, he started to chip away at me because I would be watching, uh, back then it was Comcast Sports Chicago, which is now NBC Sports Chicago. And, and the pressers, I mean, every week, he would. They'd ask him something, and he would ignore the question, or he would just go like, um, "Go to FoxSports.com," you know. Or what's that little short guy that Fox has? Their analyst that knows karate and shit. What's his name? Oh, Jay Glazer. Jay Glazer. You know, yeah. Go go see Jay Glazer for my answer. It was all these one word, just <laughs> dick answers the whole 07 season. And then you know, I'm like, God, Erlacher's an asshole. Yeah. And then in 08, a story comes out in the Chicago Sun Times. That I mean, there's a, a certain man that we won't say his name, but he's very smart. And his response to me on that was, "Well, maybe the girl was a liar. That that that's possible. But the lady that Erlacher, oh, that's something I should say. Erlacher cheated on his wife on national television in '03, the first game that they have against the Packers at the New Soldier Field. Yep. On Monday Night Football, he famously has Paris Hilton there in the box. Yep." So, I mean, throwing it in his wife's face, yeah. but by 08, he has a baby with another woman, which I'm not the moral police, whatever. But the other lady alleges that he's abusing the child and not just in a sexual way, not, not a sexual way, in a physical, mental way. She's, she alleges that he's purposely putting pink diapers on the young boy and painting the kid's toenails pink and thinks it's funny, uh, allegedly. That has the kids saying, oh, that's pretty, and like trying to confuse the, the kids' identity, identity sexually. And the mom said, you know, it's, it's warped, it's fucked, he's just doing it because he thinks it's funny. And to me, that's pretty goddamn sadistic. So immediately I'm thinking, like, damn, this guy is a fucking asshole. He's fucking with kids. He's... And then by the next year, the Bears trade for Cutler. As soon as the trade happens, as soon as the trade happens, he and Bobby Wade are going around saying, oh, Cutler's a pussy. Erlacher gets hurt in week one because he hurts his fucking thumb and he's out the whole season. Big, tough Brian Erlacher's out the whole year over a fucking thumb. And the whole season, he's ridiculing Cutler. Like he's giving, like, you know, random quotes and shit saying, I don't think we can win with this quarterback. We should have kept Kyle Orton when he's not even playing, no less. Mm -hmm. and by 2010, they, they're in the NFC Championship game. You would think he would at least you know, try to rally the fucking team. But my point is Erlacher immediately had the team divided to not rally around this guy. And you're, t you're bringing in a guy that's not affable anyway. And you got the team purposely being standoffish to a standoffish to a guy who is standoffish. So all the positive stories about Cutler would come later after Erlacher was gone. 
After Lovey, all the people said he had good leadership, he had gotten older, he'd become a family man. Maybe that's coincidental, but I would argue it's because Erlacher was making a divide with the team and was clearly jealous that there was some competition for the, I'm the fr- face of the franchise. He fucking resented Cutler from day one. So I resented him because they were on the cusp of winning the Super Bowl again, and then they don't. You know, Cutler miss breaks his thumb, and they, they're seven and one. Or I'm sorry, seven and three, he breaks his thumb. Defense, where are you? Just win one more game and you make the playoffs. They 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 go eight and eight. If they go nine and seven, they make the playoffs a year. And that's with Erlacher. That's with Briggs. That's with the great lovey defense. By 2012, Erlacher's hurt. He's gone. Uh, he finishes the year out and then doesn't sign. He retires. And then afterwards is going on Fox Sports One. Ripping the Bears every fucking week. I even heard him say they better not win a Super Bowl now. I don't want them to win ever without me. I remember that. Yeah, so it's like Vic, he's taking every shot he can at Phil Emery every step of the way. And then he said, well, if Phil Emery said I wasn't welcome. How do we know that's even true? All we know is that Phil Emery thought he was done, and so did every other team in the league. Nobody signed him. So, again, for years, I'm like, God, like when I was asked on the, this, this network, did I watch his Hall of Fame space? I said, no, I, I just I'm not a fan of his. I'm absolutely not a fan of his. I think he's an asshole. I think he we could have won a Super Bowl with Cutler. I think he was part of the demise of that team. Uh, he had those child allegations against him. One worded dick headed answers that if Cutler would have said the whole team, the whole media would have been like, see, he's an asshole. But Erlacher gets a pass on it. So I've always said, fuck him, and he's an asshole. And then what happens, you know, he immediately comes out and basically says the African-American protest, the athletes making a protest in the NBA, and we don't need to, maybe I shouldn't even go. You know what he said. Yeah. I just, it reaffirms that this guy is an asshole, which I've been saying for fucking years and has gotten a pass on. So well, I just wanted to vent. I'm just a guy in West Virginia. He's a Hall of Famer. He's never got to worry about money like I do. So, hey, he can tell me to suck his dick and check <laughs> check me. Well, I, I, I will say this, that um, Dan Pompey is a guy that I trust. I, I like him, too. Yeah, and I, I, I got a feeling that if any of this stuff was, not any, uh, but the stuff with, regarding the allegations of child abuse and so forth and some of the more seedier things, not, you know, and nobody is perfect, right? But if that stuff were true, I don't think that Dan Pompey would have fought for Erlacher to be in the Hall of Fame. So I take that a little bit with a grain of salt. I take that perhaps as a, a, a you know, I don't know. I, I, I just maybe, you know, his ex said it, you know, because they were in a divorce and she was trying no, to. No, no, it was just a baby mama. I'm sorry, the baby mama. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? It, it, I just, I hope that's not true. And uh, But certainly some of the other stuff that you pointed out is definitely true. And uh, in my mind, he is definitely a dick. That should not stop him from being in the Hall of Fame, just like, in my opinion, Pete Rose, who gambled oh, on baseball, should be in the Hall of Fame. But, um, uh, you know, point taken, and I'm glad that you shared that story. We've talked about it on the phone before. You've te- also texted me. You really have it out against Brian Erlacher, and I think that you should. I don't think he's a model citizen by any stretch of imagination. And if you were sent a Brian Erlacher jersey, Triple X, by one of our listeners. Don't want it. No, I still got the one I bought in 2000. Don't want it. I don't want it. I'm wearing a 2X Cutler right now, the orange Cutler. Oh, are so you? I can, I can wear 2X. So. But yeah, that's the one I'm wearing as the orange Cutler. And again, I am a big Cutler guy, and I still think that again, imagine, imagine any player, regardless if it's Erlager, but this guy was supposed to be the fra- face of your franchise when he's hurt and not playing. It would be like when Purnell... McPhee a few years ago was criticizing Cutler, but Erlacher was doing it anonymously, like mm-hmm. or just not even on camera, was just giving ripping him the whole 09 season to the paper behind his back. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And like I said, to openly root for against the Bears rather on TV as a pundit, 
and and say like when he he wanted the Packers to beat us in 2013 in Week 17 when it was when winner of the game goes to the playoffs Randall Cobb with fourth down you know the play oh yeah Chris, please Chris Conte. he was happy that the Bears lost oh, fuck him yeah. that was one of the lowest moments of my life no. I, I the only controller I've ever broken in my entire life was when Cobb scored on the touchdown. I threw it and broke it, and my ex-wife ridiculed me and said, you're a fucking idiot. Why are you breaking shit? Which made the loss that much even worse because she was right. But still, the, the point is, like he was rooting for us to lose that. Yes, he was. It wasn't like he was some ambassador of the Bears, like, right. oh, I can't wait to go back to Soldier Field. He didn't want to come back. All right. And the Bears, remember, the Bears even brought his fucking brother in in 03. That's right. They had a Casey Erlacher, who's a criminal now. Oh, really? I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, he's been accused of a lot of nefarious things. But oh, yeah. I digress. I just wanted to say I've been saying Brian Erlacher is an asshole for more than 10 years, which was a minority opinion. But I think I'm in the majority now. What should I do with my Brian Erlacher bobblehead? I mean, sell it on eBay for two dollars and fifty cents. That's about all you're going to get for it. No, this thing. This is one of those Foco F O C O bobbleheads. This thing costs fifty bucks if you were to go to Foco's website right now. And he's it. a fucking. He's a pariah now, though. That is true. <laughs> so. I mean, he shaved his head all those years because he looks like he's a white supremacist. <laughs> yes, he's like Edward Norton in American History X. <laughs> All right, we move on. Our last <laughs> segment of the show was what do you fear might happen in week one? Hey, and one I already... more thing, one more thing, one more thing. Sure. <laughs> Doesn't he look really strange with like the pubic hair on his head oh or whatever it gosh, is? Oh my gosh, it's stupid. It is oh just stupid. Uh, you know, he, there aren't a lot of guys out there. I'll, I'll say this. There aren't a lot of white guys out there who look good with bald heads. And Earl Acker looked good. I mean, that was his look. He wore it well. But clearly... Clearly, he did that for the money, and he is willing to look like a dick with with a who, with pubic Here's hair. my last question about it. Then, <laughs> who do you think looks stranger? All uh, bearing your soul, Erlacher with hair or Sammy Sosa with whatever's going on with Sammy? Sammy, Sammy. I'm, I think Erlacher looks worse. <laughs> no, Sammy. I'm sorry, and and maybe Sammy has that skin condition, like they say that Michael Jackson has, and so that he's treated his he, he chose a color and and he, he decided to to be white but it, it, he just looks strange and then with the greasy hair and, and so forth sam sammy just looks really really strange erlacher at least you know that was a business decision <laughs> i'm not sure what sammy's up to there <laughs> sorry so what's sammy. our last segment then what's our last segment? well what do you fear might happen in week one i already shared mine so I, I, have you given this any thought whatsoever? Uh, we did. We Santos did. Santos messing a field goal to lose. Okay, terrifies me because again they had another kicker. I don't know the guy's name. I don't know if he's any good or not. Maybe he's not. But they had another kicker on the roster and they just cut him. Right. And they bring in a guy who had a game last year. The Titans where he missed four field goals in the same game. Santos. He kick? hasn't. He hasn't been successful in the league since. Since Kansas City in like 2015, that was a long time ago. No, he had he was four out of five for the Bears when when Fox. No, brought. no, no, no. <laughs> I will look that up now. I don't believe that's true. If you're right, I will I will absolutely say that I was wrong. But I'm certain that that's not right. I'm going to look it up right now. Go ahead, go ahead. I'm looking it up right now. All right. Well, my my memory tells me that he missed his first kick, his very first kick with the Chicago Bears. At Philadelphia, it was a long field goal. It was like 50-plus yards or, or close to 50 yards. And he misses it wide right. It wasn't even close. And then he nails the next four kicks, if memory serves me correctly. And then he hurts his groin, and it was over for him. And John Fox referred to him as Carlos. As Carlos. Yes. <laughs> I'm on his uh – Pro football reference now. Yeah, yeah. that's With what the was. Chicago Bears, he was in two games for the Bears. He kicked, let's see, uh, again, two games. I hear the drum from roll. 30, from 30 of 39, he was one of one. Hang on. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Keep talking. I'm, I'm analyzing it. I don't want to get this wrong. <laughs> I think I'm right. That's why you're hesitating. No, 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 no. I swear. I, I don't. 
<laughs> two games. Ah, oh, he was one it out of two. It says he was one of one. No. It says he's one out of two. One of two. One right. of two. He 50%. made 50% of the kicks for the Bears. He was one of two. Uh, okay, so I, my, my, I'm confused because he was two out of two in extra points. So he was four out of five total kicks. So my bad. My bad. Yeah, so field goals, he only made one. Right. Right. Well, so what I'm saying, uh, my so, point is he hasn't had a, a season as a kicker where he was good. I mean, it's like 15 or 16 with the Chiefs. Right. Well, it's a long, it's a long time ago. And and Adam Hoag, who uh, is one of the very best uh, uh, beat writers on the Chicago Bears. I don't, I'm not even sure he's the beat writer anymore because he's he also does White Sox. But nonetheless, he tweeted out that for whatever it was worth, he thought that Cairo, Cairo Santos was excellent in preseason, rarely missing a kick and so forth. So hopefully, you know... He's, he's going to uh, be an adequate or more than adequate replacement for Eddie Pinheiro. Either way, <laughs> I'm worried I'm about, worried about him missing a kick. I'm worried, I'm, too. <laughs> I'm obviously worried about Trubisky's play. <laughs> I don't know about the offensive line. I don't watch a lot of Seattle Seahawks football. So the guy – what. Uh, Guy Fietti, is that the cook guy or is that our right guard now? What's his name? <laughs> Jermaine Ifidi is the now, right I don't guy. know how he plays. I don't know anything about him. I, I don't watch the Seahawks. Well, so let me, I, let I don't me know. tell you this. Uh, Bobby Massey was asked about him at the press conference today on Tuesday. We're taping. And he was asked, what do you think about this guy? And he goes, well, the first thing he said was, wow, is this guy huge? I mean, this guy is massive. And he is much more suited to be in the middle. And Jermaine Ifidi told Bobby, I like playing the middle more because I'm able to be more physical in the, in the middle. I can just rock people. And he said, that's what I have seen in practice. This guy is going to open up holes. So one of the things that I'm Sounds dying. Sounds like Kyle Long. When Kyle was doing well, he yes. liked to maul people at guard. Yes, and so I am hopeful that uh, Matt Nagy is going to remember the run game and he's going to run the ball behind uh, Nagy or excuse me, Ifidi at the right guard position because this guy is a huge mauler. I mean, Bobby Massey said he's like three hundred and sixty-five pounds and six foot five, so this is a massive man, and. Let's change the subject here. Let's finish on a more hopeful thing. Let's bear our soul about what we are hopeful for. And so one of the things that I'm hopeful for is that we're going to get 150 yards rushing. I don't know who's going to do it, <laughs> given that Montgomery not play. But let's hope there's a commitment to the run game. And that's one of the things the players have been talking about. That's one of the things I heard in a lot of these uh, interviews during the preseason, these Zoom interviews, the players saying, we are uh, the big difference this year is that we're committed to to pounding the ball. That if we don't have immediate success, we're going to continue to ride that out. And I think that was part of Matt Nagy's confession at uh, I think it was at the combine where he came out with a kind of a refreshed attitude and said, "I made a lot of mistakes last year, and one of them was that I just was too stubborn about certain things." And so, hopefully, whoever's going to be running that ball. Uh, and, and Greg Gabriel uh, very smartly said, it's not about David Montgomery you know, running the ball 25 times. It's about getting 25 runs. Who cares who they come from? And I agree with that. If it's Tariq Cohen getting seven, and if it's Cordero Patterson getting 10, and if it's Ryan Nall getting 10, and we're averaging four-plus yards a carry, I'm a happy man. So that's one of the things I'm looking forward to seeing Sunday against the Detroit Lions is a robust running game. I, I would like to see that. What I really hope uh, is that if Mitchell would make, if some some adversity comes early, maybe it's uh, D lineman that tips a pass mm -hmm. and it gets picked off and it's not even his fault. Mm -hmm. Let's say the receiver falls down or there's a PI, they don't call it. And uh, there should have been called and the, the result is a turnover. I, we, I hope that he has the wherewithal to overcome that without the crowd there, without Bears fans there booing him. So he, hopefully he'll, <laughs> even though it's on the road, but I'm just saying hopefully he can overcome any adversity. So I think, I guess what I'm hoping for is the opposite. I'm hoping that instead of Santos losing it, that Mitchell leads a drive 
and Santos nails a game winner to walk off the field with the win. I want to win. I want everyone to stay healthy. And it's going to be week one, so I think it's either going to be high scoring or extremely sloppy and low scoring. Uh, it could be either way, sloppy and high scoring, but I think it could be 31 to 30, but it could be fucking 13 to 10. But I don't care. I want the Bears to get the win, and I want everybody to stay healthy. That's what I hope. Well, you don't want, you can't afford to have Matt go out or or Akeem Hicks to go out, or even you don't even want Trubisky to get hurt. You right. know. Here, I'm going to bear my soul again and con- con- confess something that I do quite often. I'll go to bed, and in order to relax and unwind and so forth, I start p- visualizing the game, and then I – in my mind, I tabulate what the stats are going to be. So tonight when I go to bed, I'm going to think about Mitch Trubisky going 25 out of 30 for 300 yards passing, three touchdowns, zero interceptions. The running game, I don't know who's going to be run the, the ball, but 150 total yards of rushing. Allen Robinson, a touchdown. Um uh, Jimmy Graham a touchdown and Anthony Miller a touchdown. Those those are the three reception touchdowns. The Bears will sack Matt Stafford five times in this game. He Matt Stafford will walk off that field, but barely know where he is at. Not that I'm not that I, I, I want any kind of injury towards him, but I but I want him to feel the pain. Football. Let, let's face it, guys. And, and ladies listening, and this is a game of violence. And so when you hit somebody hard, that's that's a good thing. <laughs> it's a good thing for the – it's like boxing. You want to hit the guy hard. In football, you want to hit the guy hard. I don't want any permanent injury. I don't want this guy to lose his senses or anything like that. But I want him to, to be skittish in the pocket because Khalil Mack and – uh, uh, Robert Quinn and Akeem Hicks are just coming after him and just making him terrified. That's what I'm going to be thinking about when I go to bed tonight. What are you going to be thinking about besides masturbating? I'm going to work. So, <laughs> oh, that's right. Uh, the, I'll be thinking about just work. But uh, when I when I think about the Bears, what one of the things that I've, well, not to be redundant, but thought about was if Mitch wasn't the discussion might we be saying it's time for Roquan Smith to justify his first-round status? Mm-hmm. Wouldn't we be uh, more in-depth saying that maybe he's a bust? No. Yeah, that weird thing last year where he didn't like the uniform. Is that why he didn't play? Who knows? That was one of the bizarre reports. Yeah, I don't think it was that. Well, we don't know. That's what yeah. I'm saying. But it's time for Roquan to to play up to his – the way we, we put that onus on Anthony Miller and Mitchell Trubisky. Well, it's time for Roquan to, to show that – He's a first-round pick, too. I mean, Mac can't do it all. And I've been critical of Mac because he had a phenomenal 18. And in 2019, he played, uh. I mean, for Khalil Mack, uh, uh, is still better than a lot of other players. But considering the amount of money he's making and the reputation he's got, maybe he was hurt. I don't know. But he didn't play. If he has another, if his 2020 year is similar to his 19 year and the cap goes down next year, Maybe he's maybe he's moved. No, I, I'm just saying. I, I disagree with you totally on Roquan. Roquan, no, not Roquan. I, I'm talking about Mac. Oh, I, I, I veered I, off. I said if Max 2020 I, I is as bad as his 19. I, I apologize. And, oh, I'm and sorry. I, I I know. First, let me comment on Roquan. Roquan had a a handful of poor games after that whole mysterious incident and so forth. But aside from that, this guy has is has shown great promise. If if there is truly nothing mentally wrong with the guy, the guy is going to have a tremendous season and a tremendous career with the Chicago Bears. Now, to your point with regarding Khalil Mack, you know there was a uh, infamous. Perhaps we should say debate between you and Phil and Shane on 100 Proof where you felt like uh, Khalil Mack was not playing to his. uh, And not being held to account because I thought like anytime he didn't get a sack or something, we would immediately pat him on the ass and say it was because he was quadruple teamed. Five people were on Mac at the same time. There was never any accountability whenever he had a bad game. He would have no tackles, no sacks, nothing, no pressures and we would say, oh, he's so great. 
oh god let me suck his dick well i mean and, and, any other player would get criticized but not him and i like him i'm a fan of him that's what i'm saying i think he I had getcha. a tremendous 2018 right well and Khalil Mack met the media while he was on his uh, exercise bike, so it was one of the weirdest press conferences ever, because it's if you just heard the audio, it sounded like he was having sex while he was talking to the media, but when, <laughs> if you saw the video, you saw that he was on that uh, exercise bike, and he admitted that he didn't play to his capabilities, that he did not have a good year. Now, Khalil is not one to share a lot, and so he said, I'm not going to get into why, I'm not going to offer excuses. All I know in that great baritone voice of his, he said, I just did not play as well as I know I should play. So, to me, you were right. Now, also to me, you know, he was double teamed, not on every play. No, but every play. Not the on way every you, play. Everyone, no, I'm not singling out one person or even two people or yeah. or anybody else specifically, uh -huh. but I, I think Mac is a great player. I do. And I think he'll probably put up stats similar to 18 if he's healthy mm -hmm. versus 19. But I, And even when he's struggling, typically he's better than the most. Yes. But I'm just saying with all the hype that he gets. I'm with I, you. I've just thought that he deserved more criticism. That that's all I was saying is they always made excuses. Not they, not not anybody that was on the barroom network. I'm just saying vaguely. Everyone that would coddle him and say it was because he was double and triple teamed every play and he wasn't. He wasn't the, there were times a tight end would beat him single one versus one. That you is, know, man versus man, and he would get beaten. And he's a grown man. That happens to anybody. I mean, it's football. But I'm just saying we always acted like that was a myth, like it didn't. He, it, Julius Peppers had that kind of a shit when he was in Chicago that everyone always made excuses for him, yep, too. Yep, it's true. Now, I will say this, and I'm not taking a shot at Draft Dr. Phil, who has the very, very popular Tape Never Lies series. And, and he's so good at it. And he's very, very he's so good. better he's, than I could ever be at breaking down film. At, same here. And he's at, not only is he great at breaking down film, but he's also he does it in a very entertaining fashion, which is why he's got such a loyal following. But I will say this, that I do believe, and, and, and I feel comfortable saying this because I've said it to him on a, on a past 100 proof, I do believe that the tape sometimes does lie because we don't know if the guy is hurting. And so, yeah, you can be critical about, well, he didn't drop his shoulder, he didn't drop his ass, he didn't propel, or blah, blah, blah. You can be critical of that, and that might be accurate, but at the same time, you know, the, the, if the guy was playing at 75% and Khalil Mack is not the type of guy that's going to say, hey, you know, I was really in fucking pain here. Uh, Prince right. Amuk Amara, you know, who uh, I thought uh, played well last season, but clearly as the season went on, you know, he was exposed. And I think a lot of it had to do with just his body wearing down. And uh, Charles Leno Jr., you know, uh, he was a frequent target of draft Dr. Phil, and rightly so. Charles Leno Jr. did not have a good year in 2019, but there has to be some reason as to why, you know, and so maybe he, you know, maybe there were some issues uh, that we're not aware of. And so the tape sometimes cannot, is, is not 100% accurate. And like I said in the open to the tape uh, to the show, you know all, all these coaches and scouts they spend hours and hours and hours looking at tape and fuck they're seventy five percent of the time they're wrong with their their scouting on players and they're fifty percent of the time wrong in devising strategies to overcome what they see on tape for next week's opponent so. The tape sometimes does lie. And again, Draft Dr. Phil, I don't mean this as a personal attack. It's just my gut feel on, on that whole tape stuff. It's just like the numbers. There was a, a show on ESPN, the numbers uh, never lie or some shit like that. Well, come on. The numbers fucking lie all the time. <laughs> my closing statement, because I have to go to my other job now, mm -hmm. and this has been so fun, yes. and I hope that everyone else agrees because – I've I've had a great time, I, and I hope I'm going to listen back to it. And I hope that I'm as pleased then as I am now. 
Um, but I think not, not to suck my own dick. Jesus, I'm just saying. <laughs> and I wish Phil and Shane both well, and I'm sure that their show is great. Oh, they they those guys are going to do great. I, like I said before, those guys are fabulous content creators, and uh, I know they're going to do really really well where they're at. Right, and I'm not just saying that because it sounds good to say it either. You know, and I know you're not either. Uh, but to bring it full circle. Everything you said about uh, Leno and Mac, it, the whole goddamn team was bad last year. There's not really right. when we could all agree probably that Mac is the best player on the team, and everybody across the board seemed to struggle last season. Coaches, the quarterback, the O line. Akeem Hicks was hurt, so we can't really single him out. But my point is, as bad as it was, and I'm kind of referencing greg braggs when i say this i don't mean to plagiarize but i mean you're you're one pinero kick away from the the charger game to go be nine and seven in a year where literally everything went wrong and you should have been still nine and seven or maybe you say well that's negated by the kick in denver okay so you're still eight and eight in a year where everything went wrong you have to think that everything won't go wrong this year Hmm. so why not us there's there's three wild card teams now. That's right. Why why not us to at least be one of those teams? I can't see why. I, I think the Bears make the playoffs. I'm not saying they're going to win the division. I hope they do. I would love to be, you know, I don't even know if it's better to be there on the bye or the number one seed overall. It seems like the Bears have lost a lot of those games when they had the bye first playoff game. Or maybe it's better to get into a rhythm you know, and and like the Packers of 2010, and just get winning all those games consecutive. But uh, not that I want to reference them. But my point is, I I don't see us being three and 13 or five and 11. I don't like. I think the Bears have a shot. As long as you get in the the playoffs, you have a chance. And I can't, for the life of me, write a script where we don't have a shot this year. I think the Bears, very least, bare minimum, are a wild card team. And if you get in. We've seen wild card teams can win the whole fucking thing. Why not us? I like the way you're thinking, and I love the way you have presented your ideas and your stories. And I got a message for Mike Thomas and Mitch Rosen. Those two guys are the program directors. They run the radio stations here in Chicago. If you think you're going to take Dan Aguirre away from me and offer him $100,000 to move to Chicago and <laughs> – and uh, do uh, drive time radio for you? Well, okay, go ahead. I can't pay him that. <laughs> but I still want him to do this podcast with me. <laughs> oh, man, I don't deserve that, but thank you. Uh, but, yeah, it was great, and I don't want to be abrupt. I got to go to my other job. It pays the majority of my bills. And hopefully next week we're on again, I guess Wednesday next week. That's right. We will be uh, recording on Wednesday. I will, I'm um, sure, talk to you many times via the text machine and uh, probably on the phone once or twice before Sunday's game. Let's go. Let's get a victory. And I can't wait uh, for our next show. To quote Coach Ditka, go Bears! Thank you for listening to Dan and Aldo Bear Their Souls. Make sure you subscribe to the Barroom Network and you give us a rating on iTunes. Until next week, my name is Nomfe. Bear down.